Well, hello, everybody. Look at me, solo, Pete Bowman. Can you imagine? Uh, I think most people have seen from the post yesterday on Facebook, et cetera, on our socials that Ange won't be with me today. Um, not to worry. I'm not going to say, I'm not going to say where Angelo is. However, I can't say that my sit-in co-host, Angelo's brother, or our guest, special guest today, they both know where he is. I can't guarantee that they won't say where he is, but I'm going to just, for my own job's sake, sit here and just say, Angelo is absent. Okay. If I know his brother, it'll be <laughs> real quick. Welcome to the live stream. I'm glad to see that there's a few people out there already. Uh, we got some Alberta people. We've got, oh, we got a nice little list of people. Somebody from the Bahamas, which is awesome. Um, that's great. Thank you very much for stopping in and uh, spending a Friday afternoon with moi, with Fishing Canada, with Mike, myself, Jordan, and our whole team here. Um, first and foremost, what we always do uh, when we start this out, we go over the the website, the fishingcanada.com website, which we are very proud of right now. It's uh, building at, at a huge rate, and we're real happy with that. I mean, we're putting a lot of work into it, and it's showing. When, and thank you, the people that are using it, to, for you know for joining in with us on that. So uh, this week we've posted up. Look at my list here. Look at all this stuff I got on the back. I got all kinds of crap in here. Uh, let's see. My blog. I have a blog in there, Lake Ontario Smallmouth Bass Fishing, with my buddy Mikey Burris. There's a... There's a blog there, and there's also a nice little video piece where Mike and I, about a month ago, we went out to, out of Kingston, basically. Well, okay, Mike, I'll give you a, back, a little backstory on Mike. Mike Burris is my longest time best fishing buddy ever. Him and I grew up uh, together in Napanee, and we did a lot of fishing together. I mean, all we did was fish and duck hunt and, and, and bird hunt and all that kind of stuff. So fishing and hunting was our game back then. And we've still done it. We've Unfortunately, we've separated our towns now. Mike's still in Napanee. I've moved towards the GTA. But Mike is an awesome awesome angler okay and hunter too but he is an unbelievable angler he is a, he's the pulse on everything going around there um i would say i would rank him as one of the best in canada okay he's hardly hardly no one he's won the canadian uh, bass championship classic uh, years ago uh he's done a lot in that sense but he just sort of sits back and does his own thing but the guy is so knowledgeable so we got together and went out to lake ontario out of kingston now we laid a beating on smallmouth bass. It was ridiculous. So uh, it was such a, a good day on the water. Um, always a learning experience for me. I started out with six pound test fluorocarbon line, broke off about five fish, and then moved up to heavier, heavier, and finally went to the Reno Viola style of going as heavy as I could and still catching some fish. So um, it's a great little piece. You'll see the video. They're, I mean, we got one fish that was like 4.8 pounds and, and four more on video that were five to six pounds. So we had 20 plus pounds for four fish. And, and that, that day was just absolutely incredible. We just pounded them. So Lake Ontario, Eastern Basin of Lake Ontario is one of the best smallmouth fisheries in the entire world. Okay. So if you ever get the chance to go smallmouth bass fishing in, uh, in the Kingston area, do it because it's it's unreal. And not just the walleye, not just the pike and the muskie. It's, it's huge smallmouth. On the uh, our Ugly Pike uh, podcast, the guys from uh, Ugly Pike, they did an interview with uh, Marlon Prince. And Marlon is from uh, New Brunswick, and we met Marlon on a couple of uh, past Fishing Canada shows. Uh, one was called the New Brunswick Invasion, where Ange and Steve Nizwicki went out there and did their uh, did their deal trolling around and finding out about the uh, the problems we'll say that they're incurring with musky fishing and fishermen and then the second one was the saint john river musky challenge where i went out and covered an event where the, the locals are trying again to build popularity in the muscalons it, it, there's a really good this interview is really good because they're letting marlin go at what the problem is how the muskies got there uh, i just listened to it it's great uh, how they got there the problem with the people the perception of muskies in this sacred salmon water and uh, and how these muskies are supposedly eating the salmon. And then when they do gut tests on these fish, there's no salmon inside them at all. OK, so it's 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 all kinds of controversies. So I'd highly recommend going to the Fish and Canada website and, and checking on that podcast from the uh, Ugly Pike guys. We had we had a discussion, by the way, the ugly the name Ugly Pike. We still as fishermen, we get it as non fishermen. It's going to be a hard one to, to sell for the people. So those, those ugly point boys, they got to really, really push that one. Uh, in the news, uh, Parks Canada kills fish. There's a little piss, uh, piece on there, piss, a little piss on there, a little piece on there about uh, in Banff National Park about Parks Canada actually killing fish. And I'm not going to get into it. I'll let you go to the site and see it. But they're doing it for a good reason. 
uh, and as well, the MNRF, Ministry of Natural Resources, uh, Resources and Forestry, are finally printing the hard copies of the hunting regulations. All the hunters have been waiting for that. A lot of people want a hard copy of that kind of stuff. So there's a little story on that as to when you can expect it. Something I want you to do right now, if you could, as you're watching this, uh, is our on our Facebook page, page we recently uh, are going to start, we just introduced a poll. So we're going to start doing these polls. And this one, we're asking the audience whether they prefer bait casting or spinning gear. That's a big one. And uh, my prediction, when the boys were putting it together, my prediction, and we're going to show the prediction at one o'clock, one o'clock ish today. We're going to we'll close the polls at one o'clock. Uh, my prediction was spinning by far. They said, give me a percentage. And I just took a quick number. I said 75%. So I'm saying 75, you spinning, a uh, prefer spinning versus 25 versus uh, are using day casters. So um, it's just the way it is. I mean, people, it, spinning is easier. People are intimidated by bait casting, et cetera, et cetera. So please go to the poll and, and put your little say in there, your uh, spinning or bait casting. We'd appreciate that. And that at the, uh, one o'clock or after one o'clock ish, we will look at, see what was, uh, what was the, uh, see if they can smash my thoughts. And then maybe there's more bait casting out there than I thought, but I'm saying 75, 25. So, uh, let's see. I think that's about it. Um, for the website. Uh, obviously, Angelo is not here, as I said earlier. I'm not going to say why, but in his place, I, uh, I have one of my absolute favorite guys I've ever fished with and one of the most entertaining guys I've ever worked with and fished with. Uh, I still stay in touch with him a lot. He is a, he is the character of characters. Aside from Daryl Cronzy, I think this guy here is as, as entertaining as anybody out there in the fishing industry. If we can bring him on, Mr. Reno Viola, Angelo's brother. The uh, the one and only Mr. Reno Viola. I hope he's there. And, and, and I'm getting a little tired of that. Just just to go on the record, you know. For uh, okay, just here we go. What what is with this? Who who writes this crap? What crap? It's Big Brother Reno. And I, in my estimation, what? Big Brother Reno means somebody who be, who belongs to the Big Brothers organization. And I took <laughs> Angelo on as my little brother. And, and, <laughs> no, folks. I'm the original that comes out of that thing. You know, that it, I'm, I'm the original brother. He's my baby brother, or he's my brother. There you see. I like that. I didn't call you big brother. I didn't say that, right? I said my no, but, but even you, even you, you, you called me Angelo's brother. Hell, Reno's a person by himself. Yeah, okay, I get that, brother. But, see, I call you brother, too. But, anyway. But, Hey, you know what? It's good to be called something rather than nothing, which which I appreciate. Thank you. <laughs> but thanks so much for joining me today, buddy. I, I appreciate it. I've been looking forward to this ever since we got a hold of you. So, um, hey, uh, I saw that initially you thanked somebody from the Bahamas. That's one of my peeps. Oh, yeah? Um, I asked some of my on my Facebook, I asked some of them to tune in. Nice. Uh, better have it, well, depending on the name that's on there, I'm not sure. But if, if it is my, my peep. He's originally from Hawkesbury, ran a restaurant up there, and then moved down to uh, the Turks and Caicos and in the Bahamas now. And he's an executive chef. And, and uh, this guy gets to travel the world as an executive executive oh, chef. And uh, some of the food is just fantastic. So is, that that's why I'm, is that his name, Raul? Raul? Yeah, how are you doing, bud? <laughs> that's that's great. Great. Thank you for appreciate it. That's great. See, now that's fantastic to, to see that we can reach down that far. You know what I mean? Because you're you're thinking that we're in our own little world here. You know, you're, you're thinking maybe Canada, maybe Ontario, uh, uh, something small. Right. Yeah, to get out you know, to get the Bahamas. Who knows? Somebody in South Africa will be watching. Who knows? Right. So, hey, we should call those people in Venezuela that we fished with. I wasn't on that trip. You should call oh, it. I'm sorry. That's right. My little brother, Angelo, was there. Okay. <laughs> well, you guys almost died going through those trees, right? And, and that's I, no, I'm yeah, sorry. I forgot about that for a minute. Yeah. That's okay, brother. I, I have no problem with that. Because you guys have had a lot of, uh, you guys have had a lot of adventures with and without me. I know we've had some, you know, one of my favorites actually was that Mexico trip we did down to El Salto, watching you catch that 10 pound largemouth bass. That was the. Uh, I, I saw some of my old pictures about that. And, it not freaked me out because it didn't. I mean, obviously, I, I, it doesn't bother me. But I was fishing in a cemetery. Yeah, I was fishing in a flooded cemetery. And 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 the thing that that sticks sticks in my mind is I caught that ten pounder. The Blessed Virgin Mary is on top of a grave, holding <laughs> holding baby Jesus, <laughs> and, and I'm flipping underneath her arm, and that's where I caught that fish. 
<laughs> that's you know what, folks. You might be thinking Reno's exaggerating, but honest to God, we were. It's a flooded reservoir. So I don't know how we got on this subject. We'll talk about it quick before bringing our guest. But it's a flooded, a flooded reservoir that they just filled up this river area and they covered in houses, streets, everything, and including that. In in that was a graveyard, and I remember because I went in there either before or after Reno, and I was firing a spinner bait and popping it off top of the uh, off of the tombstones. Like you said, boom, you hit the tombstone, let it drop straight down and then bring it back. And th that is the honest to God truth. We were in there fishing that. And it's, it's a big fish spot on that. Well, it was a big fish spot on that lake uh, at the time, at least. I don't know now. You but. may think it's disrespectful. And uh, they, they assured us that there was no bodies and all the, everything that used to be there was yeah. gone, except that, you know, the cement, uh, yeah. They didn't move, yeah, they didn't move the, the body. Or they moved the bodies out, which is, yeah. <laughs> the best part was on that trip was Ange and I were fishing a uh, uh, a boat launch. It looked like a boat launch. And we were fishing away, fishing away, fishing. And then the guide said, look over there. And we looked across the lake. And there was another boat launch. He says, yeah, there's two boat launches. He says, no, that's the road. The road comes yeah. in here. Yeah. Out there. And we were fishing on along the road bit. So it was pretty cool. Um, what else you got going on, buddy, before we bring on our, our – uh, Favorite. I'm here to, 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 to ride on your coattails today so you know what the structure of the show is supposed to be like. I, I, Anything going on with you? I'm going to follow you along. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that I can I can keep up with you. I'm not sure. Oh, but no, I lag off behind. Wait have for me. Have you been yeah. fishing this year at all or no? Have you, been, have you been fishing at all yet this year? Peter, I have not had the opportunity to fish. And guess where I live now? I live in Kingston within eyesight of, of well, I was just talking about the whole world. It's, it's amazing. I went out for a boat ride the other day, but I, I didn't You're fish. There. You're getting there. <laughs> All right, cool. Well, anyways, uh, our guest today, let me get my uh, my info here. We Reno and I actually met this guy at the uh, at that uh, series, TV series we did, The Last Call. That's where we first, at least that's where I first met him. I'm not sure yeah. if you did. You know? um, yeah. He is the current product and web manager for Rapala or Rapala Canada or since since 2015. I, I call it Rapala because it's a Finnish company. I'll bet you that's the way it's pronounced. And Chris will be able to tell us all about that. Uh, he's been in the fishing industry for a long time since that last call. He's a photographer, a very good photographer. I will say that Photoshop guy, photographer, videographer, writer. Uh, he does a lot of stuff with Outdoor Canada Magazine, member of uh, Trout Unlimited, Canadian Sports Industry Association, Scugog Lake Stewards, et cetera, et cetera. His name is Chris Hockley, and hopefully he can uh, come on in on board with us right now, and uh, we'll have a good chat with him for sure. I see his face moving in there. Uh, there he is. Oh, Christopher. How are you, buddy? Uh, well, I'm good. You know, it's kind of funny. Nostalgia kind of hits you. I, I was out back uh, in the backstage here and the uh, the old Fish in Canada theme song comes on. And, you know, I've known you guys for a long time. You guys were just talking about it. But I tell you, that, that theme song gets me every time. I'm like, oh, I remember that. It just brings back being a kid and meeting you guys. And, uh, yeah, it was, it was pretty cool. So, Pete, you and I did meet uh, at the last call, but Reno... Uh, and Ange and I met a long time ago uh, in person at the old Durham College at that course that you guys were running at the time. Yeah, you know that was that was we we got talked into that. We didn't it, we didn't volunteer it initially, so, because we didn't think we'd have anybody in the classroom. But uh, somebody talked us into giving or pr uh, producing a fishing course in Durham College in Oshawa. I didn't know. About that. Huh? Yeah. I never knew about this. Well, there's a lot of things here. Yeah, we're a little older. Uh, yeah, well, I'm a little older. I don't know if you're older than Chris, but anyway. So we, we produced this course, and I thought maybe we'd have a couple of people in the class. And we didn't have many more, but we did have more than a couple. And here's this kid, this, this kid that's full of energy, and he's full of questions. He's got more questions than I have answers for. <laughs> so I'm, up, I'm up in front of the class, and here's this kid named Chris Huckley that Scott the whole time was as asking questions. His questions and questions and questions. And Chris, I want to thank you because without those questions, that course would have been the biggest failure in the world. We didn't know what we didn't know how to structure that course at the time. And then so your questions actually were, were a good learning experience for us to be able to teach the rest of the class through well, those I appreciate that, but here's um, a little bit of dating on this. I'm now 45. Um, my mom called to get me into that course because at the time the it was age 16 and up, and I was 15. So this was 30 years ago when this course happened. 
<laughs> and and I've got to tell you something. I still have my test. I ended up getting the highest mark. I got a reel, so I, I, I still have that reel. I still have the test. I have all the pins and memberships, all that stuff. It, it's just it's it's fun to look back on. But I can tell you some of the stuff, even though you may not have uh, uh, realized it, changed the way even yesterday I was quoting some of those things that I learned from that course. You guys did a great job, and, and I still, I mean, I've, I've literally built a living on it now. So some great information, and I thank you for that. Wow. Hey, by the way, the real, that was that was rigged. That's why you got that. <laughs> <laughs> the keenest kid, no matter what he asked, the keenest kid's going to get that award, right? I, I'm telling you, he should have got an award. He should have got a car. For being so enthusiastic about it. it was wonderful anyway thumbs up to you chris really really uh you bring back some memories and it's great and, and, you know, well, we moved and I, away from that but and i appreciate that and that was my first encounter with you guys my second real good encounter with you guys was uh the last call yeah and in that one i can say not i didn't have quite as positive a, an outcome on that one as, as i did the original course Ah, yeah, no kidding. I mean, that was a, you know what, that was an experimental for those people that don't know what the last call was a reality show that Angelo and Reno had uh, designed. I was working with them at the time. So I, I was helping on it too. But uh, Angelo and Reno designed this, this reality show based on fishing. It was a fishing competition, a series of uh, a bunch of people entered. I think they all paid a price to get in, right? There was a fee to get in it, I believe. And then there was a thousand dollars back then. Thousand dollars. Yeah. That was a lot of money back then. Yeah, back then. But the pri first prize, I believe, was fifty grand, wasn't it? Or, or, or how much yeah. was it? Yeah, it wasn't. When we gave it away, it was fifty thousand. Fifty grand. Um, and, and the whole the whole premise of that that's when first reality shows, uh, Survivor and that kind of thing were were, yeah. were hot. Uh, it, it was only the second season of Survivor, second or third season of, of the actual Survivor thing. Uh, and we ended up with I forget his name now, but he was oh. the first. Who? Ethan, Ethan Zahn. Exactly. So he yeah, was. Right. The winner of season one of Survivor, and we ended up with him as the host of the last call. So that was a big deal. And, and you know what? It, and it's, people get impressed very really easy. I mean, this guy just won a reality TV show that was a million bucks, and that's what got us on TV. We were the only television show ever to play in prime time. I mean, that's basically the 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 nut of the whole thing. We wanted to produce a show that somebody would take serious enough to play it in what's called prime time and it was within prime time so but his his real stardom came from the last call <laughs> yeah you're right chris absolutely I, you know, I'll get another reel. I'll get, i got another reel for you yeah, oh, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, because I, from what I saw from Ethan Zahn, the only reason he won that competition on Survivor was because he's a pretty boy. Because I don't think he could survive anything. He looked like a city boy to me. To be I, he, he was a professional soccer player. And right. I've never seen a guy ever. He would hit the, he'd go out in the boat. If it rocked a little bit, he'd be thrown up over the side. And he always had 10 cans of hairspray with him to keep his hair in perfect place. So. <laughs> Thank you. I'll tell you what, though. I don't remember the name of the producer for the network that, that, that we went with for that show. But as soon as I said his name, it was sold. It didn't matter. We could We could have been doing a carpentry show or, or shoemaking show it, it didn't matter as soon as i mentioned his name she says you're in wow do you remember Ooh. reno do you remember the price that it cost to get ethan to, to uh to sit on our show i wasn't part of that engine and, and our producer at the time were handling that but it wasn't it wasn't outstanding an amount it was you know it, it was reasonable otherwise we didn't have the money so we had to be reasonable amount of money so, right. so my question you guys is uh, Ethan uh, came with his girlfriend who was the winner of Survivor yeah. Africa Amazon so the, I mean it was kind of two survivors for one yeah yeah exactly yeah. and we didn't mind looking at her buddy him I didn't care too much about but her I didn't mind looking at that whole trip that was a problem <laughs> that was the only highlight if you remember the skills day that we did and it was like 12 hours long and I had to sit in that trailer that I was hotter than Hades, but it was with her, so it was all it would all work out. <laughs> yeah, you enjoyed that for sure. <laughs> Anyways, anyway, get, let's survive today. Yeah, let's, let's survive today, buddy. Um, Chris, obviously, with Rap Rapala, is it Rapala or Rapala? Let's get that out of the way right now. Yeah, so this is like the we were you were talking a little bit earlier the pickerel versus walleye, the Rapala versus uh, you know Rapala. 
Right. And, uh, you know, a, a tradition has always been, even myself, it was always Rapala, right? Um, right? But when I got into the company, I quickly realized that, no, it's Rapala. And in fact, the Finns pronounce it more Rapala. And I think it's just, to be completely frank with you, even within the company, we have people that will say both ways. I've always said, you know what, call it whatever you will, just buy the stuff and we're good. Yeah, no, <laughs> absolutely, who cares? Don't call it anything, just buy it. <laughs> yeah, but true, it is rap. How long has that company been around for? Since 1936. And the, and their first bait was the balsa minnow, that the floating repeller, or was it something else that we don't know? Here's a really, really interesting thing that most people don't realize. There's a whole lot of facets of how a company comes to be and the popularity. And what happened, believe it or not, Marilyn Monroe was involved with this. Wow. And yeah. So it's an interesting story. What had happened is um, they had started these baits. Um, some Americans, this was in Finland. Um, it was Lori Rappel, of course, was carving these things. He was having such success on them. And what he was doing was actually whittling them out of, of wood and then wrapping them in candy wrappers, putting hooks on them and catching pike. And he, he was actually um, like a sustenance fisherman. He was he was feeding his family, but also selling the fish. So that's how he was making a living at a rough time in, in Finland. And some Americans caught on to this and basically said, hey, we'd like to do the distribution for this into um, into the U.S. And at the time, they decided to place an ad in uh, I believe it was, oh, I, this is terrible. Uh, it was Life Magazine. It's on the cover anyway. So what happened is uh, the whole death with uh, Marilyn Monroe happened at the exact same time. So it is the largest selling magazine of that uh, uh, of that entire history. And in that was this Rapala ad. And that's what boosted it. It went everywhere. People wanted them, saw these. And, and yeah, it took off. And, uh, yeah, now here we are many years later and, and producing, uh, and that's part of the, probably one of the best things that I get a chance to do is I'm product manager, but I'm also on the global product development team. So I get to travel all over the world and help design different products for different regions, mostly Canada, but uh, we compare notes and it is a phenomenal company. I love working for, for the company and they're all hardcore anglers. So everywhere you go, every, any chance anybody gets we're out fishing so it's it's a lot of fun that's what i was going to say to people uh, just in case you're wondering because a lot of times product development is scientific minds etc cetera, etc cetera. but chris included because we've known chris as long as we've known chris he is a nutcase on getting out on the water and fishing he goes out on his weekends on his own takes his kids goes with his buddies goes with patrick walsh he's on the water all the time so he's not just this guy that's in the office and designing things with his pen and all that kind of stuff he's uh, you know he's a, an avid angler and it's good to hear that the whole company is like that too it makes a big city difference it, it really is and there's no doubt about it i mean rapala baits have caught more fish than any other baits you can combine them why? Because everybody's throwing Rapala bait. So it's that popular. And so they're bound to catch more fish. But they're also a great product. In my tackle box, I've got stuff that's 40 years old. It mm. still works. It still looks good. It's still functional. You know, the yeah. price has changed today. But it, it's the same bait that was made 40 years ago. You can get it today. Or in most cases, you can get it today. So it's a great bait. Great company. And, and uh, if you're going to only have a few lures in your tackle box, Make sure one of them is a rapper. Well, that's a good point. Comments is uh, we are the world record holder for world records. There's more than 500 world yeah. records. On really? Records. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. What Reno said is very got my mind working here. So he said he's had baits in his box for 40 years. So, what is the difference from the the Rapala balsa wood minnow floating minnow that was the original? from today as it was back in the day? Is there, how much difference is there if, there's gotta be some differences, but you know what I mean? Uh, zero, eh? Same bait. They, the production of course has changed. Um, I mean, it modernizes, but I mean, the fundamentals are the same. Uh, everything's the same, the finishes are the same. The, uh, uh, the hooks are uh, um, VMC. Uh, everything about them is, is now, what's changed is a lot of the lines. So we keep the original, like my first bait that I ever owned was an orange and gold jointed Rapala. It was a J9. And I remember putting it in the top of my old pal fishing box and every tackle box. Yeah. And and I still have that bait. I don't think I'll ever let it go. I, and uh, it's fun to look at, but yeah, the, the fundamentals, it's not changed. And what we 
actually done is added as new technologies come, we have a lot of different series. We've gone into plastics as well, and of course, uh, uh, crossovers. So we have our BX, our BX products that are actually balsa and, uh, and plastic, but a whole bunch of different things. But the originals are truly original. That's crazy. Now, why, why still stick with balsa wood in a, in a lure, in a, fish, in a, in a minnow bait, or even in a crankbait? What is the advantage to being made out of balsa wood? You know, a lot of thing with balsa is we all we know how light it is, so it's it's very buoyant. There's actually three different, uh, not quality levels, but different variations of balsa that they use for the different baits. Um, some, like the original Rapala, uh, weren't intended for bigger saltwater fish, and it isn't just simply isn't as strong. I mean, they can crush them, break them, so they actually use a denser balsa for for some of those other products but balsa has this incredible ability to be able to react it moves really quickly it allows baits to dart it makes them look realistic and and that's the part that just simply makes them catch fish it uh, that's the reason why they've stuck to you know lasted for the test of time anyways and and keep catching fish like you do you, you did when you were a kid right hey i got a little surprise for you guys i just it came to mind um my first experience in the fishing industry was with Rapala. Was really? With Roger. I, I mean, we had offices almost, you know, two, three buildings away. And I needed to get into, we're, we're just starting the fish tournaments, and I'd seen where in the U.S. everybody was had stickers on and, you know, the hat you got on and everything else. And so, I, so my owners were not going to be left behind. Okay, there was, there was no question. So so we, we, we got some some overalls from racing team for Fiat in Italy, said okay. over and, and then I went over to Roger, and, and Roger didn't know who I was. I didn't know who Roger was. And I said, uh, hey, listen, could I uh, could I buy? I didn't know you could get this stuff for free. You, as a matter of fact, he ended up paying me at one time to do that. But initially, I ended up paying for a bunch of little patches so I could put them on these coveralls. Uh, and today, I'm going to go get it. We're going to show it to everybody. And today... I don't know how we're going to give it away within this show, but we're going to give away my original coverall, the one what? that I picked here from a couple of weeks ago. Okay, so just excuse me for a minute. You guys go ahead and talk. I'll go get it. I'll show it to you. And oh then my we'll God. Can, can I win? win? <laughs> <laughs> you, you already won that reel. You can't win twice. Oh, fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> oh my God! I can't wait to see this. I've seen pictures of this, Chris. I've seen the boys. I was going to say there's got to be evidence of them wearing this. They're, uh, if I'm not mistaken, well, the ones I remember were kind of red with some little white striping uh, on the, uh, this is going to be hilarious because I remember there wasn't very many that did it, but do you remember Keith Farmer? Yeah, do you know the name yeah. Keith Farmer? Yeah, Keith, he came in with a, a whole coverall set up one time too. It was just like, uh, you know, all Patch Adams on there and looking, to, you know, looking like Bobby Dazzler out in the tournament screen. And everybody's, everybody's wondering, what the hell is going on here? What are these guys doing? They're just trying to make a statement. I mean, it was good because people looked at yeah. them, right? So, um, uh I just made an off the cuff remark there about it being a one a onesie and uh it <laughs> 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 door in the back. It's gonna have to be, if you've got a onesie, you better have a trap door, especially with those Viola brothers, that's for sure. Yeah, um, you know, we gotta be careful with these pictures because some things can't be unseen, right? <laughs> I see a lot of the comments there. See, look, you're getting a lot of good comments here. Rapala Rocks, Tagabox Box full. Uh it was you know, one guy says he had a hundred of them. Uh Calvin's got dozens of them. I think it's a, it's a known fact that Rafala, uh, to this day, I mean, just for that. Oh my! I told you, we had the stripes. Oh my God! Look at this. Are you? Hey, can you still fit in that? No. <laughs> I can't even put one leg in it. <laughs> oh my God, buddy! But wow. if you look at this, where is it? Right here. Oh, there it is. There it is. That thing cost me 50 cents. I want you to know in about 1980, that cost me 50 cents. <laughs> so I had about five or six dollars worth of patches. Right. Yeah, of course, all because of the BASS. I was one of the original members, likely. That and then is an amazing oh, piece of history. Oh, I've never had their name on a, on a shirt before. Well, look at this. <laughs> Real Team Danko. Hey, so there's another Rafla logo on the back. On the front, is that an LJ logo? I don't know what you mean by that, but here it is. Yeah, it's on. It was on the front. Can you flip yeah, it around? This is on the arm. Yeah. Okay, this is on the arm. Hang on. Right there. Now go to the front. Did you say there's another one? I thought there was. A, yeah. So that's your back. There's. 
Yeah, right there, Lure Jensen. That's Lure another Jensen. one of our brands. There you go, another one right there. Yeah. Yeah. So it made the front page. <laughs> <laughs> it's just because it's symmetrical. <laughs> I mean, that is awesome. You have that. Uh, that's, I can't believe it. You have that. Look well, at this. Let's, let's figure out how we're going to give it away. I, I'm willing to give it away. Um, wow. Yeah, we got to do something special for it. Oh, for and, sure. uh, and maybe somebody can put it up in, in a frame or something. I don't know. You know what? We could do. We could do. I don't know if it'll warrant it or not. We could do a contest on the website with you. Know what I mean? Like that. Why don't we do that? That's, that's it. exactly. That's so. That's so incredible. Yeah, make it big, man. Holy. Is, like I want to win that thing. Okay, I'm gonna <laughs> you know, God, I want to win that thing. And the day we wore those, I, I, I remember all this stuff. It's little little pieces. I forget good stuff, but the the little meaningless stuff. We were at the. Uh, Kennedy U.S. Walleye Tournament. Yeah, yeah. Um, in Bob Cajun, but on the uh, on the Pigeon Lake side, and that's where we debuted those. Angelo and I both I had we had a matching set. Obviously, we're the Viola Brothers for God's sakes. Of course, we're going to have matching sets. So <laughs> there's, there was Angelo must have his somewhere, but there she be. So if you if if you guys stay and follow Fishing Canada um, the website. Peter will figure a way to give this. Um, look at the comments already. I'd enter. A, I'd enter a million times. Tyler Scott says, "Love it." Uh, <laughs> Calvin has a picture of. Uh, mind you, Calvin's got a picture of everything in fishing Canada. He's freaking Angelo <laughs> out on that one. Uh, and you look. It, Ken Johnson says it'll look great in a man cave, and that's so true. I mean, that is something that you would like. Reno says you put it in a shadow box. You put it behind a glass. You do something with it like that. That is so freaking. One question, Reno. What is Danco? What would what did Danco stand for? Okay, that was at one of our first companies that D A N, and then Co was company, but right. Miano was my father's name. Yeah, Angelo was A, and my name. You guys call me Reno, but it's Nazareno, so D A N C O. Ah, yeah. was your dad part of that company? Or just yeah, dad, dad was part of. Of course, he's my dad. So all, all the financing. He was my he was my financial wizard. <laughs> just all he had to do was cut a check for it. That's all he did. <laughs> <laughs> he'd, be the perfect, he'd, be the perfect, huh? he'd be the perfect banker too because if you guys failed the payment he'd kick the snot out of you <laughs> he was a beast I, i'm gonna tell you we Ange and i sometimes took chances oh. and the way you make it is because you take chances there's just no oh. question about it right but sometimes we took some chances that we really shouldn't have taken uh, and we needed a financial backer, and there's nothing better than a financial backer who slugs his guts out working. My father, that's all he was a working man, that's all he was. Yeah, yeah. That would would help us. <laughs> he would just help us. It was it was great. Um let me just try you know we grew up. Reno's father is just a little he was a little guy, he was my size, a tiny little man. The only difference between him and me is that. He would kick the piss out of me in about three seconds flat because he was a nasty little dude if he had to be. He was the nicest guy in the world. I loved him. He was a, he was the best. When he came into the office here, he, him and I had a great rapport. We're the same size and all that. But I would have never messed with that man in my life. And the stories that I heard about him, too, I guess he, not too many big guys. No, we're, we're not going to go over that right now. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Well, thanks, Reno, for that. That is so freaking cool that you would let us uh, – Somehow give that away during the, you know uh, through this. Oh, what, what's this? Monique wants it for the wall of. What's this? What's going on? We got to give it away. It's a family heirloom now. Uh oh, now you see now. Oh, now all of a sudden, okay. You know what? You know this is even better because now you know what's going to happen. Is Monique and Angelo are going to butt heads. Monique's going to say I want it here, and Angelo's going to say No, 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 we're giving that sucker away. We just, we just <laughs> made a nice little infight there, buddy. I guess it's going to be perfect for that. <laughs> and by the way, it's nice and clean, and it's been hanging there for what thirty years. That is awesome. It's great. It's awesome. It, it really is. All I can say is if anybody's watching this on the webcast and you do win it, you have to just sort of every now and then take a picture of it or do something that's just to keep us reminding that you, you have won. And if, if we want indeed a winner to come out, we'll probably stipulate that on the website that they have to, you know, once a year, send us a picture of uh, people looking at it. Maybe get some signatures on the I don't know, whatever. It doesn't matter. But it's uh, that's, that is nostalgia at its best. For sure. yeah, that's all, all back to the Rapala thing. So, so yeah. Roger Cannon was the president. And here comes this guy, this Italian guy who, he, I don't know. And I walked into the door and, you know, oh, yeah, I'm going to be the next pro fisherman. There was no pro fisherman up here before. And, and it, yeah. by the way, I never was pro. Nobody. I mean, there's two or three now, 
But yeah. before, none of us were. We all we all had other jobs. Yeah. And, and so I told Roger that I was going to you know, recreate the world and set the world on fire, and I needed to buy some patches. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I got it. <laughs> that is so awesome. Today, so. Great stuff. Now, just remember, everybody, to, to change the subject very, very shortly. Uh, again, that poll is going on on our Fishing Canada social site. So please, uh, actually, I'll ask the boys here how to do this. The, the poll is... Uh, what is more pop? What do you use more? What do you prefer, spinning versus bait casting? So, what do you guys think, Angelo or Reno? And then Chris, uh, Reno, what's your opinion on what the percentage will be? Uh, what'll be higher than the other? Well, for, first off, I grew up with spinning, so yeah. I, I've got this natural love towards spinning. And then when yeah. when I got into bait casting, reluctantly, because yeah. I bought one a long time ago, but it you know the first six or seven months and probably into the next season, which so a year. I didn't use it because every time I touched it, it blew apart on me. And the, the, yeah. the, 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 you know, I have a bird nest, and it was tough. I, I used to go through a spool of line just every time you want to practice cast once. Boom, the line's gone. Yeah. I didn't know how to get it out. The way you go, so the so, line kept getting caught in the zipper and his onesie. Yeah, that's it. Baby. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it was difficult for me. But once I got the hang of it, then I went to the extreme. Right, I, so I went from from being a spinning guy to everything was big cast everything it didn't matter and you know back then uh, one of the real manufacturers that we were with uh you know made little tiny big casters and big ones so then there was something for everything and, and so i started using that and then i got into the smallmouth bass fishing in on uh, in the kingston area of lake ontario and there's nothing that you can do with a bait caster okay it, that a spinning won't do better lighter line more contact uh, more, actually, more accurate. I know he's supposed to be more accurate at casting with bait caster, but I can cast pretty good with a, with a spinning, yeah. and it for me it's it's more suited for that job. So yeah. today, to you answer my question, which one I prefer? Today is it's a tool. So whatever works best for that particular application, that's what I'm going to use. And because I'm going to lighter and lighter and lighter line because of the fishing pressure and the water clarity and all that kind of stuff, spinning is probably going to get my nod. Okay, now give me, before Chris answers, give me your prediction on how our poll is going to end out. If they average the general public uh, that uses our, our Facebook page, they're going to go spinning versus bait casting. Yeah, I think probably 60 to 80 percent. Well, maybe that's a big gap, but 65 percent will say spinning. Perfect. Chris, what are you thinking? For yourself, and then what do you think for the poll? For myself, I got to agree with Reno. You know what? They're two wildly different tools. One is a great finesse, lightweight um, kind of bait product, uh, or so you can deliver something either into the wind or lightweight. And then, of course, the bait casters are a lot heavier. Um, they don't have to be, but you can you can use them for you know some real heavy stuff. So so for me, I use them that way as as a tool. I know um, having inside scoop as far as where our sales are at. Um, and of course, having worked for a number of different companies in the industry, where yep. the are at, and I would say that uh, your estimation of seventy-five percent is probably low, Pete, on sales uh, versus bait caster. Um, but here's my kind of spin on it. I I think that um, most people have, as Reno said, traditionally picked up a spinning reel, but you actively have to work at trying to learn a bait caster and fish it properly. And I think those people who are picking them up, spending that money on them, are also looking for information. And so I think they're the ones that may be online, you know, looking at the the polls maybe a little bit more just than the average guy who's picking up a spinning reel to fish casually on the weekend. So I would say, I dare say that it'd be 60-40. 60-40 spinning. spinning I think the guys are going to show up and say, yeah, bait casting is my favorite because they're online looking for that information. And you guys have a lot of great info on the site. So. Right on. I mean, they got the other reason is simplicity. You can use the spinning backwards and upside down like they do. <laughs> <laughs> so what you just I, I don't know how you do the bait caster upside down. That one doesn't. Well, I had to try because I'm lefty for for bait casting. I'm lefty, right? That's the other thing about bait casters. If we start talking about rods and reels, most people don't even know. It's like me and golf. I don't know whether I'm a right-handed shot or a left-handed shot. I don't know. I, I don't. Know. I do it badly in both of them, and and, and so. Baitcaster is exactly the same way. So I don't even know back in, I don't know, 1980 when I first got my first baitcaster, why I chose a left. But I, I naturally, I'm on left. I crank with my left hand. Right. And, and so you guys are all doing the old, what is it? Switch it, it, Cast, switch, and yeah. retrieve, right? That's what well, I do. Me, it's cast and retrieve. 
Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's funny. The history behind that is we had an argument, uh, not an argument, but we had some conversation over, you know, some new products and whether you would put a spinning reel into a box with set up left handed or right handed. And one of the things that came up through history is the tradition of being because there's a lot of people that are left handed retrieve on a spinning reel but right-handed retrieve and a bait caster. So the right. number one selling bait caster is by far right-handed. Number one selling spinning, I mean, they're ambidextrous of the switch, but it was actually back in the Mitchell 300 days. The Mitchell was so far ahead of the game at the time and they only came in left-handed. And I, and so the, the theory is that people just got hooked on, if you wanted to fish spinning, you had to fish it left-handed. And, uh, and so I, I'm fortunate I cast with my left and I retrieve my right with both. So I don't do any switching. I just cast and retrieve the same thing. But but that that's kind of the a bit of the history on it. That's and, uh, I like that. I like never thought of that. Because, you know, but well, I'll tell you, just before you say something, you know, I am a total switch hitter. I do. I mean, I am spinning. I use my left hand to reel in, my right hand to fight fish and cast everything like that. Bait casting, I cast with the right. I switch it over, hold the rod with the left and reel with my right. It's just the way... For me, okay, so number one is the way I've done it forever, but I've tried to change because I, I can see the efficiency of casting with your right hand and reeling with your left and bait casting. But for me, it's all about coordination. I am so right hand dominant and I'm so <laughs> left hand useless. I am horrible at anything with my left hand. Honestly, it's just brutal. So for spinning is no problem because basically with spinning, I don't really see my hands here. You set the hook and you reel down to the fish, set the hook, reel down to the fish. So you're kind of a, doing a two part move. With, with bait casting, you're doing the same thing, but a lot of times with bait casting, you can hammer that, you can hit the fish and hard and not even do the rod. You're just doing everything with your right hand too, right? To, to pull in a, a large mouth bass out of pads or something like that for the people listening. I feel much better and I do much better doing it with, that way than if I set with my right, which is my stronger arm, which would be the better hook setting arm, but reeling with my left, I'm just so off, I, it's, it's ridiculous. So it's a feel thing for me. It's all about coordination and feel. I will use my weaker arm for the hook set and I'm all about the hook set when it's fishing. That's my favorite part of fishing by far, setting that hook hard, as hard as you can. Even a little guy like I am, I want to stand on my tiptoes and give her as hard as I can. But, <laughs> but, but it's, uh, you know what I mean? So that's, that's just a, a coordination thing. So I do the the normal, the average, let's say, not the normal, the average of right hand, left hand, all that stuff. Whereas these guys both are, are doing uh, right hand rod, left hand reel, right? That's what both of you guys do on both systems? No, I, I'm left hand on the spinning reel, no problem. I'm like everybody else. On the bait caster though, I cast with my right hand. Yeah, so I said. Automatic, mm -hmm. just start reeling. Yeah. yeah. And for me, I, I cast yeah. up my left on, with both and I reel with my right with both. Oh, okay. okay. Right. Oh, wow. okay. And I, I didn't have to teach myself that. It was just natural. I think maybe for the same reason, um, I'm so left-hand dominant that, uh, that yeah, I, I, can't, I can't imagine. I, it's like turning boxes if I'm turning with my left hand. So I can't imagine being able to do one with a spinning and other with the bait casting. It's yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty good. I'm, I'm left or right hand pretty good. And that all comes from my mother. When I used to sneak into the house late at night, I knew she'd be behind that door with the fly swatter. So I didn't know whether to cover up with my right or, or cover up with my left. So I became pretty good at both. And and, and, and so I, it stuck with me that I was I should be doing something with both. But one of the disadvantages to using a bait caster with a left-handed reel for people who are right-handed, because when we're doing pitching and flipping uh, under trees or under docks or whatever it is that we're going to, the handles sometimes get in the way. Because you got mm -hmm. that line in your hand, you do the pitch or the flip, and then you let go of the line. And sometimes, depending on where it hits, the, the, the handles, it actually gets wrapped around the handles. So on my boat, I always have a right-handed reel. So my, my, my pitching reel, if you will, is right-handed bait caster. Wow. I've never seen yeah. you throw it. Remember, it's a short cast, right? So it's a short cast. You can set the hook. And yeah. you're right. Now you've got a hook. And, and you, can, you can make your mind do this. There's winds um, in hand, right? Yeah, you can. So it's pretty good. It's pretty neat to be able to do both. I do, obviously, left-handed better. So. so here's a question from Brad Bose, Boz Bose. Why wouldn't you use your stronger arm to handle the weight of the fish and use the gear deficiency on your weak hand to crank the reel? It's a great point. It, it's The reason for me is it's just a matter of feel. I've, I've, I've caught enough fish 
in my life to know that my weak arm, my left, is strong enough to pull in any fish. I've done it. I've not been beaten on my left arm, so I know it'll work for me. So then I just use it as a coordination, et cetera, et cetera. But it's a great point because, yes, you should be using your stronger arm for sure. But I've done it through, through time and through repetition for me. My weak arm, which I say is horrible at anything, my left arm and my left hand, but it, it is very efficient at setting the hook and bringing the fish in like that. It's just, and that's just built in muscle memory or whatever it may be. So it's a great point. I mean, you should do that. You should use your stronger arm to its advantage, you know, especially when you're going after big fish, muskies or whatever. You know what I mean? You know, you want like Chris just did there last week, a nice little trip to musky land. Yeah, so anyways, there, there's, I mean, there's all kinds of, uh, there was a bunch of other questions on there, but that I mean, basically we don't need to do that too much, but uh, unless you guys want to. Oh, there ahead. it is back up here now i was just going to say ken had asked a, a a really good question and you know about the the gear ratios and it's something that actually things are really changing if you remember uh just kind of a bit of history again if you go back with rods it used to be im6 and then it was im7 and im8 and that was how you bought the better you knew that each one was a better quality those That's are actually, uh, chris is talking about graphite, uh, graphite. Right. this is graphite so because of that it was really really i mean im6 meant absolutely nothing uh, it was just a modulus. They gave it a number. And so a six could be better than an eight. It could be any way. So what they started to do is do rods in tonnage. So what they would do is a 46 ton, a 42 ton, a 36 ton. It was actually the amount of graphite. It's the way that we purchase graphite to make rods. And that's the reason why they do it. So now everybody's, it's apples to apples. You know, you'd have one company saying I am six and another one saying I am eight. It didn't mean anything, but now with tonnage, it does. Well, the exact same thing, a gear ratio on a reel uh, used to be, I mean, 6.6 .6 to one is, is, is an example. So for every one rotation of the handle, the spool ro will rotate 6.6 .6 times. So that's your gear ratio. Um, the trend is now to go to faster gear ratio. So we see reels on the market now up to, you know, 10 to one, you know, so for every one rotation of that handle, it's, it's turning 10 times. Well, the same with those rods. And there's a reason why I started with that is now instead of that 6.8, because it, that, that spool may rotate six times, but if the spools this big around versus this big around, it, it means absolutely nothing as to the amount of pickup or the amount of line that you're going to pick up for every time. So now what we're doing is actually putting instead of gear ratios on there, we always put gear ratios because it's standard, but there's also the amount of pickup. So it'll tell you how many inches of line you pick up per rotation of the handle. And again, that's an apples to apples thing so that you can compare any brand against another brand and realize or any, that's, any within that's based, on a, that's based on a full spool, I'm assuming, right? Is that the way they do it? That's right. Okay. Yeah, that's yeah, right. Yeah. Well, that's good. That's good. Now, I don't know, Reno, you'll probably remember this. Chris, you probably do too. Quantum came out years ago with a flipping and pitching reel. And it was like a three or four to one gear ratio. And the thought back then was it's a, that's like a winch. You just crank it in, you crank, there's no worry about your gears because the higher the gear ratio, the faster the reel is, the less you can do that. Back in that day, that was sort of the, the idea. It never really went through. And then five to one was a normal retrieve. And this was either four or three something, whatever one. Nowadays, guys that are pitching and, and flipping, but more, more pitching than anything. So pitching, just to let everybody know, is a very short cast, like Chris was saying, from 20 feet, you know, 20 at most, boom, 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 these little quick casts. But what you do is you drop your bait in and then pick it up and reel in as fast as you can. That's where that seven to one or eight to one ratio is really very handy. Yeah. There's no time now. Now you're you're not wasting as much time as trying to crank in that four to one or whatever like that. So that's why guys are going to that. And the same sense, when you set the hook, you know, and you do what, like I said, you pull and reel, pull and reel. Well, now you're picking up that line so fast. It's very efficient. You're not using it as a winch. You're pulling, reel, pull, reel, pull, reel. You're using everything as a tool together. That's what these the fast gear ratios are now being used in the pitching. So. And, and, and you know, you're, you're walking me right down memory lane, okay? Because during that era, we we the, we at the television, at the Fishing Canada show, we were with Bonnie. And, and yeah. so we got a, got a hand and we had a hand in designing some of the products and, you know, features and, and, and different things on it. And a couple of things come to mind. Number one, that's where the, in a flipping reel, specifically a flipping reel, you don't want to take the time to pitch it and then switch hands or do whatever you do and click it so that it's engaged. Well, we were part of that. As soon as you leave, leave as soon as you take your finger off the spool, it locks. Well, so you were ready to, to reel in. So we were part of that. 
Um, of course, that also got me into a whole bunch of trouble because I, you can't cash with that because as soon as your finger leaves, boom, here's this, this three ounce weight going out there and it stops at eight feet in the air and it's just going to come back and get you. True, true. Uh, but some great things back in that era, especially at Quantum. I mean, Quantum was a great company back then. Um, probably is today too. But, you know, the, the, the little handle, I think it was Linder who actually designed it. But basically, uh, rather than a, a straight rod and reel from butt to tip, okay, the handle actually dropped down and it was angled. I remember that. Wow. Remember that. Wow. It, it, extraordinary. But people couldn't get used to it. It just, it was really weird. But there was a lot of, you know, the fishing industry is one of those industries that just keeps reinventing itself. And, you know, Chris, the, the, the spool to pick up and then the, the number on the side. And, you know, it just keeps marketing and inventing new stuff. And that's why it's such an exciting industry because there's, it never gets boring. And you're always learning from it, right? If we had to stop with the Mitchell 300, we'd all be dead by now, even though it was a great reel. It was a great reel. It was a good reel. I think I had one. You want to get oh, one? My, my, very first, my very, very first reel was a 300. And then my next one was one of those uh, uh, those green, uh, what was it? Uh, Cardinal? Cardinal. Yeah, okay. Cardinal fours with the little Cardinal four. tool on yeah. the bottom. Yeah. Rear drag on it and all that. I may still have the body to that reel, actually. I don't know. I think the spool popped on me and broke on me. But that was, you know what? That was a great reel back then. Fortune now. Oh, yeah. They probably are, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So let me give um, you a different side of that real business, boys. Of course, we also owned a large retail store called Barclays, as you guys both know. Yeah. And when I never, and we used to fill line for customers, and sometimes we were on the floor, so we would do the line filling and, and you know, exact whatever we had to do. But anytime we saw a customer walk in with a Cardinal Four that he wants to, he wanted to respool, it was like I don't want to talk to that customer, and you'd back off, and you'd get lost in the store somewhere because. What? Inevitably, well, okay, they were a great reel. They really yeah. were a great reel, but they had horrible spools. And so because of the age of the spool, the material that the spool was made out of, it eventually dried out more than it needed to, and it became brittle. So here we are with these high-speed line-winding machines. That, well, you remember, Chris, you used to love wine line and wear and there. So, and, and, and now you're overfilling, not overfilling, but there's tension as you're, over, as you're filling the spool. You're actually increasing pressure on the side of the spool, and and, and you too much pressure, and boom, and these these uh, these spools are split in half. And, and so now I got a customer out there. Not only have I lost the line that I put on there because I can't resell it, I got a customer who wants a brand new spool. Well, you know, you came in for a dollar fifty worth of line. I'm not gonna if I could even find it. I'm not gonna give you a forty dollars spool. <laughs> it makes sense, right? And and and, and you couldn't find them. That was the other thing. So here's this guy's got a great reel on the, the the body and the little thing on the bottom with a place to put a spool, but no spool. And how do you do that? So so we stopped rewinding Cardinal Four spools because of that. that yeah. Little stories that just like, there's a million stories. Like that. You know that that brings up a story that uh, reminds me when you said Barclays, I was there when you guys decided to close Barclays. I came down and I decided to help out. I was just wanted to be a part of it. It was a piece of history, and and so I was there. And Reno, it is probably the best story I have of you, because I remember there being piles of product that you had had in, or you had an inventory, or maybe you brought in for a sale, and and specifically it was a pile of thermoses. And <laughs> none of them were selling. And you came over and gave me some heat and said, you know, you're not selling any thermoses. And I'm like, hey, dude, I'm here for free. Like what? <laughs> and and you said, well, let me show you. So he walked over and I kid you not, I wish I had this on, on video because he, he walked over to the thermoses and started a speech about these thermoses are the best on the market. And it, it, not only does it keep stuff cold, it keeps stuff warm. <laughs> <laughs> well, Fundamentally, isn't that what a thermos does? I'm not kidding you. The, the people, he sold that entire stack and it had to been 15 minutes standing over it telling people that it kept things cold and warm. I mean, I, 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 I don't even know what to say about okay. it. But, but let's go back to that for a second. So of all, you know, the internet and telephones, all that kind of stuff, what's the greatest invention? It is the thermos. The thermos. Pretty damn good. There's no question about it. Look, you, you get up in the morning and you fill it with coffee, and by four or five o'clock, there you go. By four or five o'clock, that coffee is still warm. Otherwise, you won't drink it. 
Okay, so it keeps it warm. However, there are days like today, for example, down here that's just sweltering that you don't want to put coffee in there. You want to put something cool. And so you put ice cubes and whatever you do and you put it in there. And at the end of the three or four o'clock in the afternoon, you want that cold drink, right? And it goes But I'm going to go buy a thermos after this. I know I'm going to. I have a cold. That's what's going on. That's why I keep blowing my nose. It's not that I, the white stuff or anything like that. I don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Not that we were thinking about that, but you know. Yeah. Anyway, the point is is this: so it keeps hot warm when you want it to keep warm, and it keeps stuff cold when you want it to stay cold. And I want to know how it knows what to do. It worked. Chris's point of, of Reno doing that doing that pitch. That is a for the people that don't know Ans and Reno, other than. The television show that is classic violas at its best. Both those guys would do that, and as a matter of fact, because they had this like these were the big yard sales they had, or the closing sale, and all that stuff. As a matter of fact, they would challenge each other. They would be, and I'm sure they did that before because before all this fishing stuff, they sold uh, Vespa scooters, they sold light bulbs, they sold uh, shoes. They did all. so. I can only imagine the competition that went on between that pair of. of Pecker heads, because I'll tell you what they were—they were—they're were hilarious. But I could just see them, just button heads, because it was—they'd say that they would say exactly what Chris said. That pile of whatever is not selling, and then Andrew would give the whole store shit. What's the matter with you people? What? Watch this. He'd go out there and he'd do the same thing that Chris just said. Boom, 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 boom. He'd sell it all. Reno go do the same thing, and then if they, if they had. They had a couple of salesmen as well that could do that too. Baba Mel, remember Baba Mel? He was good. There was a few guys that could could do it, but that that shows you salesmanship at its best, and it's 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 pretty rare nowadays too in stores. Like, you know it it, it's, it's not so much that, that you're a better salesperson than somebody else; it's you have more passion for what you're doing, and and like, your company too. You're living right. What? Well, well, not me. I mean, yes, I owned it. But right. I didn't. I didn't have a salary or anything from that. So no, it was money selling that stuff. Yeah. Right? So, but but again, in in the fishing industry, let's take it back to this, the fishing industry. There are only very few people who are passionate about the fishing industry, and that's the ones that you see, Chris and and uh, and Corey Johnson. Okay. Yeah. Passionate about the industry. These guys are up at three o'clock in the morning to practice. And they're off at nine o'clock at night in the dark. So they're, they they get there in the dark and they leave in the dark. They're good at what they do because of the time they put in. They, and if you don't have that passion, you become very normal. So and, and you don't want. To, well, how come you're on my side here? I'm not sure I like you that close. Okay. I like you in the middle. I like you as the middle man. I just I hit the wrong button on my computer. I was going to go to the private chat versus versus the comments. Blah blah blah. I get it locked out. But a moron. Uh, my first day with this new computer, gentlemen. Sorry about that. We're back. Uh, sorry, Irene. Uh, no, you, you have to have passion, and you know what? You have to have passion in everything you do, and. In the fishing industry, you're still in it 100%. Both of you guys are. Um, Chris, and I'm sure you see a lot of people walking around there that are here. We don't really know why they're here. They do their job. Mm -hmm. But the, the real successful ones, the ones that people look up to, the ones that make a difference, the ones that, that, that inspire you to do something are passionate about what they do. And, and, and that's all we were. We were passionate about making sure that people got into fishing back then. And remember, we were at, at, at the curve of 19, whatever it was, 1981, 2, whatever it was, was the beginning of it. So not only did we have a ripe audience, but we also needed to, to, to well, we had an audience to show them how passionate we were about the stuff. And that's why they bought rods and reels. That, that same closing, uh, Barkley uh, shut down. Uh, well, you know this, but the rest of the world doesn't. When Walmart... Uh, or any big large retailer at the end of the season doesn't sell rods or reels. Well, they call the manufacturer and, and they say, "Hey, uh, send the trucks with the nest on the end because we're going to send these things back to you." And so, just when we had decided we were going to close Barclays, we had a connection to some truckloads of fishing rods, one style that was going to be Walmart return. And guess what? We bought them. Yeah. So we bought them. So we, I don't even know the number. I, I, I forget the number, but probably in the vicinity of, I really don't know, 15,000 rods. Okay. Oh. I, I, 10,000, maybe I don't know that number. Yeah. 
But okay, so now you got them, and, and you know what? They're Walmart rods, so they're not not all of them are necessarily good, or or desirable rods. And so we had to figure a way to get rid of them. Well, tell you what, we sold them in ten days. We sold all fifteen thousand because we were there, the same as the thermos. We were pitching the rods, and you know, oh, here, buy six or seven, use them for tomato steaks, and use them. <laughs> <laughs> Loading pallets with them into the back of pickup what? truck. Yeah, oh. that's the best. That's what you have fun doing, folks. And, and if you take anything away from this broadcast today, is be passionate about what you do because you'll eventually turn out to be good at it because you're passionate. Yeah, 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 for sure. Look, I'm gonna I'm gonna move a little bit more. I want Chris to get a, on this one because I think he can really answer this question. And I bet you a lot of people are asking about it. How has COVID nineteen affected fishing sales uh, in in your companies uh, and all their products that you guys sell? Yeah, you know, it's something that uh, I, none of the industry was prepared for. It's not something that anybody had any experience with. And I've never seen anything. Our sales are up to the point where, I mean, our customers are calling saying, what have you got? We'll take it. I, I mean, it, unbelievable. The sales are our sales on our, uh, you know, e-commerce are up astronomically, the same thing. Uh, I mean, heck, you know, Pete, if, if you go to, and I've seen this, every day at the boat launch it doesn't matter whether you go through the week or if it's the weekend the boat launch is packed there's no more boats on the on the the, the water in fact i, I work with the local marina here that the same thing he says we're completely out of product they've sold through everything there as well i mean it's selling i don't know where the money's coming from but it is really really cool one of the things we've spent a lot of time and obviously within the industry is how do we get relapsed anglers back into fishing because we could double you know who we're selling to and that's happened already i mean there are more people fishing right now and buying fishing products it's it's exciting to see not because i mean as a company you can be selfish and say yeah you know it's great we're in a great position we got lots of product and we're selling tons of it we're all getting rich it's not that when you go out to the lake and you see that many people fishing my concern is let's how do we keep these people continuing to do this because it is incredible I've, I've never seen sales like this ever any idea on younger people fishing now i mean you might not get that as kind of a stat but maybe what you're seeing out there are we getting more youth involved is it more uh, elderly people middle-aged people any idea yeah I, it's really hard i mean obviously in our sales we wouldn't see that but uh you know the demographics don't really show up there but if we're, if you're on the body of the water i'm seeing a lot more people families out fishing with youth um, which is great to see i mean there's there's a there's a huge wave of women anglers which is great great to see um and that was well before covid um sure. now to see that and then on top of that um families fishing with you know uh, i mean it, it's just phenomenal it, it's great as a passion we were just talking about passion it's great to see these people getting in enjoying a sport that they maybe haven't done in a long time or had done ever so our challenge now to myself as a, a working with a manufacturer or you guys working in the media is to help these people have good experiences and whether it's making a good product or teaching them how to use it properly so that they're successful you know better than anybody that those bonding times between parents and you know sons daughters families friends whatever and through fishing are second to none and that was, that's the excitement that's come out of this thing there's it's a it's a it's a real positive to a very negative pandemic of course yeah 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 and you know you see it i'm seeing it in in news feeds etc worldwide fishing license sales are up uh fishing sa product sales are up and i figured that was going to be your answer but it's just unreal like when, when we first you know after about a month or two into the pandemic you're here in the u.s because we were still kind of in the cold weather so you know not really into our peak of, of fishing but you're starting to see these u.s license sales booming all of a sudden more sales more sales of that and it makes total sense let's be honest you know what i mean it's an isolated sport it's not like you're going out in a boat of thirty-eight thousand people you're going on a boat with maybe your family or maybe a buddy or two and you know uh, it's, it's it's a very isolated sport or can be a very isolated sport, right? To that point, it's interesting. We've actually seen some stats from the uh, American Sport Fishing Association and their sales in a lot of the states, in Minnesota in particular, are up 40% of fishing licenses. Wow. You guys, I mean, you know, your family though, I mean, let's go, let's go back. This is a good cycle. And, and first yeah. of all, I, I'm a totally different believer of, of, of the pandemic. I do think there was a, there's a problem, but I, I don't think we should have shut down the world for it. I, 
it kills our economy. But but in killing the economy, I, I think it grew family. Uh, mm -hmm. I really yeah. do. And 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 it made you understand how much you missed other people and how much you need them and what they mean in your life. And so so now that we're able to get back out for the last couple of months, that that pent up. Um, need and urge to to get back with family and to find something that you can do with family is going back to our roots which is to do with the outdoor you know have, have sunday dinner together and, and all that kind of stuff as well as enjoy the outdoors which is relatively safe to do and if you're, you're isolated so you're not touching things and, and i do think that the pandemic has helped a lot of things grow and it's not just our business but uh, today that's what we're talking about but it's every business cars are out they're out of stock um, fishing rods obviously run the stock yeah. for us in the mortgage business it's, it's been fantastic there's never oh, really? been yeah. it's, there's yeah. never been a better eight month period in all of my career period wow. but that aside we'll just we'll just go back to the family. It, it bonded families back together and you know what I, I think it'll you know, the little resurgence that you were talking about about get, how to get kids back into fishing and all that stuff i think this is going to help yeah you know? I do. I think it's good for the, for for our industry. It's good. I think I, I really hope so. It'd be nice to see. I mean, let's let's be honest. The recruitment of younger anglers is not you know it's not where we need to be right now. It's not like days of old when we were kids. Uh, you know, and this uh, Chris Hockley, the avid crazy little kid that loved fishing and more than anything, and a lot of his buddies did it too. It's not like that anymore. It's no. uh, it, it's dying off. So this might be uh, you know uh, a definitely like Chris said a positive to the negative for sure i'm going to change this subject again boys because remember we talked earlier about the poll well the poll results are in so the spinning okay. what they prefer spinning versus bait casting now reno i think you guys both come up with the same thing it was like a 60 40 60 for me yeah 60 40 chris said the same thing as spinning versus bait casting oh, i said 65 i think okay <laughs> Well, just to go hire Chris, just in case, right? The price is right. Uh, yeah. Guess a dollar. And I said, and yeah, I said, that's how it is. About and I guessed about seventy-five percent spinning. So we were all on that. Uh, the, we definitely all feel that spinning is more popular, more preferred. We'll call it than bait casting. I don't know if the boys can throw this graphic up. It'd be great to see. I'm really interested. There you wow. go. Look at wow. that. Higher that's than all of us guessed. I mean. That is incredible. 77%, 23% spinning over bait casting. So that question was, what do you prefer to use? Not what works better, whatever like that. What do you prefer to use? Spinning versus bait casting. So 77%. That's uh, that's no. up there. Reality is this. Reality is, is this. Is most people have one or I get on the outside, two rods and reels. You know, most of them one. Yeah. None of those would... You, your first purchase will never be a bait caster, right? Your first it, it, so you, it's a spinning reel, and so you yeah. grow up with that spinning reel. And how many times a year do you fish? Three, four times a year. So you probably have a rod and reel that might be eight or ten years old. So that it, and that progress uh, or progression will take you into your adult life and, and on. And you know how to use a spinning, so you get a better spinning. Something that winds better, something that takes more life. So spin, it's not a surprise. It's not a surprise. Spinning is what we grew up on, and it, it's we're going to die on that too. So and you got to remember that that there's specifics. Like you, you almost need a reason to buy a bait casting rig. You can use spinning on any kind of fishing, right? But as bass fishermen, like largemouth bass fishing is the perfect example. A musties, etc., too. But but big fish are one thing. But even smaller fish, the largemouth bass, a perfect example of needing a bait caster in certain situations. There are times when spinning is no good for largemouth bass fishing. It's not near as efficient. So you have to see about what you do. So most of these people out there are walleye fishermen or fisher people or yeah. are they trout anglers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They have no use. They have real no absolute need. For bait casting, they can get away with spinning for 99% of their fishing, so they wouldn't even buy it, right? So the popularity, you have to think about the popularity, too, and the usage right there. Is that bait casters are big because the, the U.S. guys, you know, made them popular in tournaments, and bass is their number one fish down there. And, and that's why bait casters became popular. And then when we tried them, they became efficient to us, too. We're saying, wow, I can throw, uh, twenty back in the day, 25-pound monofilament line. That stuff is thick. Still to this day, thick, right? You can't put that on a spinning rod and fish that efficiently. Well, I beg to differ with you. Well, you probably could if anybody. Well, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna paint this picture right in front of your head. That, that, that. Okay, Roland Martin, 
who is the, the, the number one heavy line guy yeah, yeah, yeah. in Florida and, and on his television show. Right. And back to the old Mitchell 300. Okay, right. that, that's what he was. That's who paid his bills was Mitchell. Right. And Mitchell 300. And and he didn't use bait casters on his show, at least early on. Right. Because they weren't available. And they, well, they were available, but they weren't available to him to use on the show. And so he caught all those giant bass in that in that heavy, heavy mat and all that kind of stuff on spinning reels. Right. Remember that? Back, yeah, back in the day. You can, you, can, you can catch bass on spinning reels. I didn't say you couldn't, but I'm saying a better a better tool for the job. How's that? I'm going to tell you why. Real quick, people watching here. Tool this, for the job is keeping Roland Martin's family fed. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here's why. Let's just use 25 pound monofilament as an example. It's a bad example because not a lot of people use that anymore. There's still, you know, a good line for certain things. But let's we'll say 25 pound fluorocarbon, very heavy, very stiff line. So, on a bait casting reel, think of it a bait caster. If you're using that heavy a line, there's a reason for that. There's heavy junk. There's big fish. There's whatever you're trying to avoid all the problems that come in. You want it basically when you get a fish on, you want to get it back to the boat. Well, a bait caster, that line comes in like a winch. It comes straight in over that spool and comes back just like a winch. When you see a car winch, you know exactly what I'm talking about. The car winch, the spool, there's a spool that just pulls you out. It's all about torque and power. On a spinning reel, you've got your spool that's stationary now, and you've got this bale that spins around. So it's the bale that's spinning on a, and a 90 degree angle. So your line comes in, turns a 90, and then rolls onto this spool. Well, when you start cranking that like a winch, it doesn't work so well. There's an angle in there. It slows you down. There's no torque. There's no power. There's less power, less torque. So that's why the bait casting is so efficient in heavy. heavy to, now, a line size doesn't really matter. We just set up a couple little setups for your bait caster, and you've got that 25 pound working perfect. Whereas 25 pound line on a spinning reel, I'll tell you what: when you open that bale and cast it out, first off, you're gonna you're gonna hear the worst noise of your life. That line's gonna slap everywhere. It's gonna hit your fingers. It's stiff. It's nasty stuff, and it just doesn't work as well on spinning. So that's my take on it, and I'm sure you guys would closely agree on that. You might have a few. I'm not gonna disagree with you. I'm yeah. Not. I'm just saying yeah. that if you've got spinning, you can you use. Or you use the heavy junk, use it. You're going to get fish because you're yeah. not fishing more than five, six feet away from the boat anyway. So, yeah, works great for catching pickerel. What's that? Works great for catching pickerel. Yeah, all oh, there. Yeah, <laughs> what, the pickerel bike or the pickerel what? And which one are you talking about now? Because I'm talking to you earlier. We were talking earlier. So okay, here we go. Yeah, let's bring this one up. What time we got? Oh, we got lots of time. The pickerel versus walleye. The ordeal of uh, what is it? A pickerel versus a walleye. I want to get some comments before I give you my shot on it or my shout on it. To me, it's walleye. It always has been and it always will be. And I have uh, my my ultimate answer to that one is very simple. And I'm going to show you in a minute because I think Mike grabbed a, a comment. But you like my dad, for instance, the old school Ontario boys, for sure, like these guys that are. 70 plus years old, 75 years old and older, they all said pickerel. It's a pickerel. You're going to go and get some pickerel? We're going to get some pickerel. Well, the honestly of it all, pickerel and walleye are different fish. Like Reno was saying, the pike pickerel. So it's a chain pickerel. There is a fish called a pickerel, but it isn't that golden, beautiful doré and French uh, fish that we catch, uh, the, what we call walleye. A pickerel is a different fish. It's a complete different species but it is a species of fish it looks just like a pike in shape it's in the esox family the pike family and it's just got a different pattern of, of markings on it. they're not very big they're nothing like a pike and they're not even close to a muskie but they are the same shape they're just smaller and they have different pattern uh, spot patterns on them. so um it's called a chain pickerel have you guys either i know reno's caught some chris have you ever caught chain pickerel yeah in fact we uh were out last week and ended up getting into some so they were uh, <laughs> They're wildly aggressive. Where was that? Oh, it's Lake X. <laughs> so, is it, let's just say, is it Ontario? It is, yeah. Really, eh? See, there's not a lot of lakes with chain pickerel in Ontario. No, no. And that's what we, I think amazed us is uh, um, took us a second to realize what the heck we'd actually caught. We just thought they were just little tiny pike, but uh, uh, that wasn't the case. But, but yeah, you know, it's funny because you can actually talk to somebody and say walleye and they'll answer you back with pickerel and you know oh. what you're talking about. 
Yeah, it's interchangeable. Every it's time. Interchangeable. Almost every time, almost every conversation, including what's going on on the right right now, uh, Ontario slang. You see, so James gets it. Walleye, pickerel is part of the Pike family. Ken gets it. Walleye, pickerel, Pike. Well, this one with, with uh, Ken Johnson says, great debate. Hey, walleye versus pickerel. No comment. Too much controversy. See what I mean? <laughs> There's like, when you start seeing this stuff, I, I I think we should call him Xander. I, I don't know. <laughs> but again, it's a different fish too. But it's closer. You're right. It's a different fish, but it's closer, right? Listen, all I all I I think what happened was there wasn't a lot of walleye in the U.S. I mean, northern U.S. there was, but when Canada became a tourist destination as a fishing destination from the folks in the south, they came up and caught our walleye. And it was delicious right. to eat and everything else like that. They didn't have walleye, so they didn't have a direct translation, but they had chain pickle, which right. they picked. Yeah, they're similar, foot, foot, and that, whatever. They, they could be, to a, to a non angler, they could be thought of or mistaken as the same fish in a, in a wild way. So I think these, these American tourists from way back you started calling them pickerel, and that name stuck. That's all it was. It's just a matter of, and I'll tell you what, there's some, there's I some, losers like Daryl, Daryl Cron, who still calls him Pickerel. Hey, yeah. and he eats yeah, yeah. too, and he catches them and eats them too. Uh, okay, so I'm going to, after Mike switches us around here and all that stuff, I'm going to throw up a graph, and Mike's took a little uh, PDF uh, graphic screenshot for me before this was uh, all started, because I thought we might be able to talk into that. So hopefully Mikey can get that ready, ready for me there. See that little circle? Uh, this is the Ontario Fishing Regulations, okay? It says walleye. Nowhere in the Ontario Fishing Regulations, which is what you have to use as Bible, it's the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry, do they call it a pickerel. It's called a walleye, folks. It is a walleye. It always has been a walleye, and it always will be a walleye. They're not going to change. They change the scientific name of it. That doesn't mean anything to us, but it's not a pickerel. It's a walleye. It's a walleye. And, and, and across Canada, if you go... We've got them in British Columbia, so now they're in their regs. We've got them in Alberta. It's in their regs. They're all called walleye. So unfortunately for those people that want to say pickerel, you're saying it wrong. It's a nickname. It's like it's like Reno Viola. We used to call him the Bawana. The Bawana is a nickname. The Reen Machine, it's a nickname. But his name is Reno Viola, and it'll never change. Chris Hockley, we call him the Hawk. We call him the Hawk, H-E-W-K, the big bird. Well, it's not even spelled that way. It's Hawkley, H-O-C-K, Chris Hawkley, Pete Bowman, Bowrod. All my buddies call me Bowrod. It's a nickname, but the real name is Pete Bowman. The real my, name people is Walleye. That's yeah, it. I think of it is, you know what? You're never going to change anybody's mind. If they're calling them Pickerel, it'll be forever oh, Pickerl. Absolutely. And I, I can just get it out. And it'll be a Walleye. It's like this, Rapala, yeah, Rapala. Absolutely. Rapala. Uh, yeah. I don't care what you call them, as long as you're fishing for them and having fun, I think. But to me, the interesting part of the conversation is what Reno brought up. Where did it come from? I, I, I'll i tell you, I was on the lake up north fishing along. I was fishing for walleye. And some people yelled out along the shoreline and said, hey, what are you fishing for? And I just told them, I said, walleye. Oh, you're American. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, what? Uh, so the interesting thing is the, the, the idea that it's Americans call them walleye and and then where did pickerel actually come from and, and reno you suggested a, a reason there and that's the interesting part to me so read that guy jean guy duguay and mikey if you can get that up there we go let's see what he says here it's not actually a nickname it's because of u.s culture brought this naming convention because of a similar species on u.s side so okay it's not a nickname. what is a similar species to a walleye it's a walleye what else do they have down there? They don't have sand. Yeah, but Pete, the, these tourists, American tourists, they fished three days a year. Remember, these guys are coming into Canada for, for a three-day adventure, their whole life saving in three days, and they get to fish. And over there in the States, they didn't fish that often, but they saw a fish that was like this, about this this big, where are we? Can't even see anymore. Whatever, about a foot long, and, and and it was green and it was long and it had you know a long nose. In a glance, it could be a similar fish. So they come up to Canada and they said, "Well, we caught all kinds of pickerel." That's and that's all it was. It, it's nothing. And then we, it all stuck. You know how it sticks. Stuff sticks to us. Yeah. It's the interesting point though, some eighty-five-year-old guy is going to get caught with eighty walleye in his creel. <laughs> And the 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 the, the, the CEO is going to say, "Well, I got I got to fine you for that. I have to. You're going to jail." 
It's not really pretty. The guy says, why? He says, these are pickerel. And the CEO is going to show them that piece of paper you said circled with walleye. He says, well, no, that's a loser walleye. These are pickerel. <laughs> so you're not going to stop this argument, okay? It's, it's, so it's, it's confusing, but reality is they, there's some people in Canada who will always call them pickerel. For sure. And if they don't fish very often, some of, it's been brought down through the generation. Some of these younger folks also call. Yeah. Them. Yeah, for sure. It's not going to change, like you said. It, it, it will get lesser and lesser as the older generation of pickerel sayers moves on, let's just say. Not, you know what I mean? But, but it will always be there forever, uh, ever and ever. So I saw that last graphic there, Mike had up about it. All I can tell you, though, folks, okay? Uh oh. You got, no, all I can tell you, no. One time <laughs> in your life, I don't care. One time. You're not going to eat chain pickerel. You're not. They're just too small and too bony to even do anything with them. Right. But you got to eat a walleye at a shore lunch in Ontario, and it, there's nothing like it. There, as oh my God. Absolutely, there's nothing that you there's – no, there's no weight against it. It's, <laughs> it's all by itself. And, and if you haven't done it, it's, it's, it's a bucket list. You have to do it. it absolutely. Uh, if somebody said to me, uh, you can have the best steak – that the keg offers steak dinner versus a walleye shore lunch. It would be a hands down walleye shore lunch. I wouldn't even, and I love steak. I wouldn't even think, and I've had lots of walleye in my day. I just love that. The walleye shore lunch is such a classic, a great taste, and it's a great feel, the whole ambiance and the environment, right? So, yeah. so yeah, if you haven't tried walleye at a shore lunch, that's maybe hire a guide if you're going to a, a lodge or something like that, or even if the guides do it somewhere else. Chris? Oh, what's that? Are you still guiding in it at all? No, I haven't got the time to do. I mean, a couple times a year with friends and stuff, but well, nothing. Yeah. I I really think that rather than guiding for fishing, I, I get that. That that's fun too. But yeah. if somebody in southern Ontario could recreate the onshore lunch, yeah, there you go. Be, oh my God, I'd be there. I'd come from Kingston. I would. We and, could social distance out there too. Yeah. <laughs> well, there you, well, you're right close to it. You can do it on the Bay of Quinty. You got to be able to find some kind of a place where you can throw a shore lunch on the Bay of Quinty. Good. I'm sure. Yeah. I just don't do all that. There's another yeah. one here. Like, there's they're, now they're starting to go on jackfish or northern pike, and it's the same thing. Great In thing. Saskatoon, they call northern pike jackfish. That was from James. Um, uh, Frederick had that question again. To me. It's just a nickname. Jackfish is just a nickname. Jack or jackfish. And another thing, I worked with uh, when I worked construction, I worked uh, with a bunch of Sask Saskatchewan uh, guys. Uh, what do you call them? I was like, what's it? What would you call this person from Saskatchewan? There's a name. Saskatchewaners? No, whatever it was. And they <laughs> said, Saskatooners, yeah, probably. Saskatooners, hey, what's up, ladies? They uh, <laughs> they had uh, they called them slough sharks. Pike. Yeah. They called them slough sharks. That was but those are pike. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's not, they, they, yeah, yeah. not rockets. <laughs> it's not rockets is another one. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, anyway, so we got, we, uh, I think at least people get my opinion on it. It's walleye. It's not pickerel. Okay. And it's a nickname contrary to the couple of little comments. Absolutely. I still think it's a nickname. I think and that's the way I, I'm going to stick my, my reputation on it. That's exactly what it is. Chris, you brought, we're going to, well, we're still got a good time. Chris brought up another good uh, a point. When him and I were talking a little bit earlier, um, the frog migration is I, on. I was hoping you'd go on that one right there because oh, I looked at it. Oh my God! That there is nothing like the frog migration, and most people don't even know what the hell it is. I'm gonna get Chris to talk about it. Oh, it's the most because I had a, a very good friend of mine, my best friend. His son is now getting into tournament fishing, so it's really fun to see them start getting into it. And they were up north. And they had a, they were mid pack at the end of the day, but they said, we didn't figure it out until the end of the day. He said, the fish were up so shallow, we wouldn't have imagined it. Like they were almost, their backs were out of the water. And I immediately said, oh, it's because the frog migration, they're looking for frogs. And he said, oh my gosh, it took us all day to figure out that we needed to throw a frog. And that's exactly what had happened. It's so funny because I always tell people this, there's, there's frog migrations and I always find if you're driving at night down a side road and you see frogs jumping across the street or across the road, get onto the water and throw a frog because at that point in time, they are up shallow and that's exactly what was happening. We put the two and two together, but there's those fish will be up so shallow. It's unbelievable. Uh, and that's exactly what they're after. And they're so focused on frogs that oftentimes, you know, you throw a frog 
fish blows up and misses it. And then they left a big hole. And so you quickly put that rod down and you pitch in a worm and you dunk it and you, you know, nothing. Like, what the heck? And reel it back up, put it back down. Okay, we'll go back to frog fishing. And you throw it over that same hole and that fish will come up and hit that frog again. They, they don't want the worm. They're not interested in it. I'm eating frogs. It's like me at a, yeah, a buffet. I'm, I'm going for the steak. That's probably, that's probably pretty dangerous right there. You at a buffet, isn't it? I got to yeah. have a steak. <laughs> I put a few out of business. <laughs> so, you know, do you know the theory, uh, anything theoretically behind the frog migration, Chris? Is it a timing? Like, when does it happen? Is that, obviously, it's a timing thing. Um, but we're, by the way, we're talking about largemouth bass for the most part here, folks. But and, walleye will do it at night, too. Walleye eat frogs. Smallmouth will eat frogs, too. So anything will eat frogs, but it's mostly a largemouth thing. So if you know, do you know any technicalities on it? I, I think a lot of it has to do with uh, there's moon phases, of course. Uh, the fall migration is the biggest one that I'm aware of. It's when the fish or when they're actually moving into, you know, where they're going to um, remain for the for the winter. Yeah. Uh, but it's really strange to me that you'll see it throughout the year. And, and I really don't know. I, I, I will often I mean, throughout the day, at some point, you always just test it to see. I mean, you've always got a hollow body frog on and you throw it around just to see what happens, because when they're on it, they are on it so hot. Yeah, it's it's the most fun type of fishing that you can do. And uh, and you don't want to miss those opportunities. But uh, I don't know. Do, do you guys know anything more specific? Yeah, other than for me, it was triggered by the first. And right now you're noticing the day getting the light getting shorter and, you know, mm -hmm. at night it's dark. And so that period and also the temperature. So in uh, round right around now, and it happened to us here in Kingston about a week ago, when you feel that that there's a chill in the air, it's not cold, but there's a chill in the yeah. morning and in the, in the night. It's frog time. It is. Yeah. It, it's yeah. it, 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 unbelievable. So with with the uh, the moon phase, the water temperature and the air temperature changing, I that's when it happens. It, it triggers them. They start moving. I'll you know? tell you another uh, another effective way of catching these these quote extremely shallow fish is not just with a frog. What Chris is saying is first and foremost, and that's your, your probably your best way of doing it. But a flipping jig is such an efficient way of catching these fish too because they're so shallow but a lot of times they're not in open water shallow they're being a tree being a little patch tiny patch of pads they being these little wee things but right tight to the shore and the reason i'm saying this is because i was out um, at the cottage last weekend and i was fishing away fishing away and all my normal stuff catching small fish i got a large mold very close to five pounds just under five and i hit a small tree that was parked up against the shoreline. I hit the outside of the tree, which I always do first to try and pull a fish out if I can. And then my next pitch was right in between the tree and the bank. And that fish did not come out at all at the, at the far end of the tree, but right at the bank, that fish hit. He did a flash, you, like Chris said earlier, I had no idea, the fish was so shallow, at a, five, at a 480 to five pound largemouth, he shouldn't be in that shallow, but he was. He was sitting there doing something and he was feeding up close. So, uh, you know, that you can use other baits too, aside from a frog. The point is, get right tight to the bank this time of year and on and beyond because it's going to, somewhere it's going to pay off for you. So, hey, you, you mentioned Mike Burris, one of the best walleye and bass fishermen that I know. I mean, I love Mike. Mike's a great fisherman. Yeah. The very first time that you, he, and I fished together, we were taping a show for, for Fishing Canada. Right. And he had never pitched underneath trees this time of year. He never pitched underneath trees for walleye. <laughs> right. Do you remember that? Yeah, I do remember. Yeah, that. I, let's cast in there. And boom, we caught our biggest fish of the day underneath a willow tree where a bass should have been. You guys were getting like. Was fishing frog. Frog. There was not, that's all they were doing, we chasing frogs. Oh, so. right. Okay. I never put two and two together till just now because that got, that became a pattern after a while. I mean, yeah. we, we got 10 pounders under yes. road doing that. Like ridiculous that you thought there'd be, you know, you thought there'd be a large mold only spot. So that just shows you how you got to diversify your tactics, your tactics, your techniques yeah. and your thoughts and your mind, right? Fish is a fish. If he's eating frogs, he's up there shallow eating frogs. He doesn't have to wait till it hits the water and swims away. He wants to get it as soon as it pops in. Right, yeah. surprise attack sort of thing. Mikey was great. Mikey's now onto a. He just called. I just talked to him yesterday, and uh, I might be going up to see him this weekend. Actually, and fishing together. He, uh, I got him. So he is using. We're Garmin people at Fish Cannon Ange and I. We're, we're Garmin sponsored. Mike has different equipment on his boat, but I told him about this Garmin Live Scope stuff, and so he said, 
that's it. I'm going and buying one. And he went and bought a unit, single unit, on the live scope transducer, just because of what I told him, what I was showing him and all that kind of stuff. He's on to a splake pattern now. He says, Bo Rod, you need to come up here. I am on to something big time with this live scope and splake. So I can't wait. I'm hoping to get up there this weekend and do it with him. But uh, he's always, he's such a diverse angler. That's exactly what he does right there. He's on those lakes that he's been catching all kinds of beautiful large and smallmouth all year. And now he just said, I'm going to try some splake with his live scope. And now he's pounding them with live scope. So he's, he's, He's that good, and he's a guy that I, I learned so much from, and and he and he's so unassuming, you know. Like, don't put a camera in my face. I don't want any of that stuff. I just want to go fishing. Why he wouldn't cast underneath the tree after we cut that fish? He wouldn't cast under the tree. And I, why, why are you? He said, "I don't want to show it on television because it looks phony and it looks, doesn't look real. It doesn't. It, it can't happen." And, 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 no, I don't want to fish. He said, "Don't no, put me off camera. I don't want to do it anymore." Uh, he's a like, yeah. uh, down to earth kind of guy. That's but, cool. well, it's, it's amazing. And, you know, he is a classic winner, obviously. Yeah. And I'll tell you a story about Mikey. I, I don't know. We're jumping all over the place, but it's fun. So Mikey Burris won the classic in Lake Ontario. Yeah. And he won it in Wampoos Bay at Wampoos Marina is where he actually won it. And if you guys, and I was there this weekend. I just went by there, and I, I, I couldn't, I didn't fish it, but there was the long floating tire dock. There's a tire dock. It's a break yeah. wall. But it is. Break wall, yeah. Uh, but the, and when I went back after he won it, I went back about a uh, well next season. I went back to look at what he well what he had fished, and my God, there were, there had to be three hundred bass underneath that that great wall. It, it was amazing. They were tough to catch. Well, how legendary! Oh my God! Yeah. And, yeah. And so and Mikey, and the story with Mikey is this: he, he says, Reno, I don't know what made me stop there. He says, I was doing 60, 70 miles an hour in my boat, heading down towards the interior of Wampoos Bay into the creek to go, and my motor stopped. He says, it must have been my guardian angel. Stopped uh -huh. my motor. And he tried to start it, wouldn't start. So he figured, wow, what the hell? I might as well fish. And, and, and then he just he drifted into that great wall, and there was all those bass underneath there. So, <laughs> so that's Mikey. Mikey is just a uh, – and he was so humble when, you know – when he was telling me that story of how he, you know, he was just a great guy. If you ever get a chance to meet Mike Burst, folks, look him up. As a matter of fact, he's a great guy. He'll show you all where his fish are. He'll tell you anything you want to know about fish. He's just he used to guide. I don't know if he's guiding anymore. He used to guide. I'll look into it because I'll tell you what, if you want a trip on the Bay of Quinney with a guy that knows his stuff, that's the guy you hire right there. So I'm not he's, sure if he's still doing he's that. He's Rappala Bates. He's one of the original Rappala Bait guys. He really does. Oh, yeah. Stuff. Yeah, so. yeah, for sure. Right. Very quickly, Ken, we'll go what, very quickly to Ken. Then I want to get a couple more things with Chris here. When are you guys, Ange, Reno, and Pete going to do another fishing show together? Reno, I'll let you answer that one. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Are you ready, willing, and able? I don't. I don't own the thing anymore. I don't control it anymore. I don't do anything anymore, other than if I'm asked, and and somebody's paying me at scale. You know, Angelo. If, if, hey, Angelo, I need a kidney because mine was going bad. <laughs> How much money have you got? Do you remember that? <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, so, so basically, uh, whenever you guys ask, we'll, we'll do a show together. That would be a pretty classic. I think it'd be a good show. I think everybody, including Chris Hockley, would watch that show. Um, I would be on that one. And if you guys do it and you decide to get matching onesies to do it in. Oh, my God. Let's I talk will, about one more time. I'll get you free patches this time. <laughs> good point, Chris. Let's look at this one more time just to make sure that, that, that we get it here. Look. That is. So remember, it's a onesie. Look, 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 oh look, look, look. I think That's I was probably about 165 pounds <laughs> when I fit into this thing. It's got the dual zippers. Oh, the oh dual my God. God, God, God! This this is first class. This worked on racing cars. Hey, <laughs> if we shorten the arms and legs of that, it would fit me, buddy. I just have to shorten it up a little bit. <laughs> it, it, would would it. it would definitely fit you. Look at there. Reno, Janko, look at that Rapala. Look at that Rapala. <laughs> that is so awesome. It's bigger than the other ones. Probably cost me a buck rather than 50 cents. There you go. We'll see that right there. We're going to put that somehow. We're going to get Angelo involved and we're going to get fishingcanada.com. We're going to run a contest somehow to win Reno's jump, uh, classic jumpsuit with his Rapala patches and et cetera, et cetera on there. That is, I mean, that to me is, is gold right there, buddy. That is gold. Look oh at that. That is 
<laughs> well, we'll fight. We'll put, we'll figure it out, and then we'll be posting on Facebook as as Mike has put up there uh, as to how we can win. Um, Chris, let's quickly get into any new products that you've. Uh, I know there's new techniques like the Nico technique. It's not new. It's new to a lot of people. The Nico technique, the Ned rigging, as you told me that what, tiny child or whatever it was called, the tiny yeah. child technique. Yeah. And I thought it was a joke, Chris. Told me, I, Reno, did you get that link I sent you? I saw it. It was good. I thought it made sense. sense. I thought yeah. Chris was pulling my ass. Well, he said, I thought he said a tiny child because I thought somebody's, you know, oh, this is a cartoon, a meme about a kid on the end of a hook. But uh, it's, actually, <laughs> it's actually a technique that's been out for friggin', you know, actually almost about a year. I saw a 2019 post on it last from Mike and Ellie and all that stuff. So it's been around for a while. But what, what's new out there that people can look forward to? Uh, all around, not just bass, maybe walleye, maybe anything else. Is there any product? So I, uh, I mean, we have a lot of different things, and we have we have uh, a number of different companies uh, underneath us. Of course, there's you know uh, Rapala and Storm and Gamma uh, or uh, Gamagatsu here in Canada. We have VMC. There's Suffix. There's I mean, there's so many brands. It's uh, and with believe it or not, we have almost fourteen thousand different items. It's incredible. So it's hard to keep on top of everything. Yeah. Um, yet the the team keeps pumping out some great stuff, and and this year uh, one of the new ones is the uh, uh, the Rap V, um, which is a uh, I don't know if I have any uh, like I said I didn't send any images to you guys, but uh, it's called the Rap V blade. It's like a cross between a lipless crankbait and then a blade bait, which is the metal ones. Right. Um, you can you can use it. It's kind of like one of those throw it anywhere, catch fish everywhere kind of baits, right? You can throw it out and reel it in straight, and it rattles and shimmies and shakes. It's got a little bit more of a, a thump to it than a tight vibration, which is something, you know, again, different tool in the toolbox. But you can then also use it vertically, and you can use it for ice fishing that way. You can use it for vertical fishing for lake trout for any other species. So it's, it's a really cool one, lots of different cool new colors. Um, it's actually, it was released back at ICAST. Um, so it is in stores right now, so it can be it can be purchased. Um, we have a lot of other ones, new hockey jerks this year. We've come in with some really cool new colors, um, particularly for Quinty. You know, you see those uh, those crazy colors the Quinty guys use, and and uh, they've also translated very very well into Great Lakes uh, um, salmon and and steelhead too. The, the, they just crush them, so it's it's a lot of fun. Um, some really cool new baits, but. Um, one of the things that's been just on fire for us is uh, VMC, and and it's a company. It's kind of funny because it, it's a. It, I mean, VMC is the largest producer of hooks in the world, uh, by far. Nothing even comes close. There's a, a most brands of uh, hard baits are using them, um, so it, it's really cool. But the the product development behind VMC is is great, and and it's so exciting at this point. I, I laugh because it's they've kind of made terminal tackle sexy again right and and because of uh um because of these techniques and the way that they're going about them the um cyril who is the um basically head, pro head product development he, i mean he's the head up uh, for for vmc but is very very works very very close with our pros in the us and they come uh, come to us with any ideas and they jump on it right away and they'll do a whole technique specific everything you need for that technique is then there with VMC, and we've seen that with uh, the Tokyo rig. Uh, I mean, that one has a story behind it. Uh, Mike Iaconelli had gone to uh, Japan, ended up seeing this uh, Tokyo rig being uh, set up and used, and then brought it back and um, shared that with Cyril, and they've now um, taken that technique and expanded it into a number of different products, but it became so big so fast that it, uh, I mean, it overshadowed. We, our producer of the just the metal um, said, hey, I, he threw his hands up in the air and said, I, I can't do this much. So we ended up having to find another supplier that could actually do wow. that volume. It was, and, and what it is, is they've taken a, it's basically a variation of a drop shot rig and, and a, no better way to say it. It's, you know, you have a hook. Actually, I think it, I think it provided we got an image. I think Mike's got one too. Hopefully, he can put it up for us and all that as as you're talking. You can just yeah, that. it'll be a little bit easier just to. But so what it is is a hook of your choice. So it started out as a as a standard uh, R bend uh, worm hook, and then it has a, a wire that comes down off of the eye, and then you can put any weight that you want on it. And the variations on those weights are great. You can put a um, like a, a mushroom style uh, weight. You can there's um, Rugby, uh, for sure. I mean, pull through all kinds of different stuff. Um, but what most people were using was actually uh, yeah. 
So they put a bullet weight on the, on the bottom. You fold that wire right where it says, uh, yeah, sliding weight goes here. You can put a, a bullet weight on there and drag anything you want. Now we've changed the hooks on that to include, um, you know, straight shank hooks and Nico hooks. And so you can do finesse things and you can do all these different things. But what's really cool with it is that you can also put two weights back to back. So you can get two uh, bullet weights and it creates almost like a, uh, a cylinder with two pointed ends. And what you can now use it for is to punch. So you can throw that thing. The wire comes out straight. We'll go through the thickest of mats, drag your bait down. And instead of being like a Texas rig where it pins the weight down and you're, you know, you're, you now got this, um, it's, a, it's loose, so your bait is able to freely sway and turn and do whatever. I mean, I look like a magician going here, but uh, once it gets down there, it's the it just looks so much better, and it's incredible. And, and it's fun to see how people are taking this thing, and, and uh, with our new rugby-style weights in the bottom, uh, they're putting swim baits on them and dragging them for smallmouth or dragging them over rocks, and they look incredible. Wired to Fish did a, a really good video on it uh, where you can see – this thing coming through the water and I immediately hopped in the boat went out and tried it because I hadn't thought of that one myself and and it just right. looks um, I've, so I've got walleye on the Tokyo rig too believe it or not when people are you know it's not just a bass rig it's it's you're open right. your mind it's just like a jig basically I put a small swim bait on there like a nice little three three and a half inch swim bait on there and all of a sudden you've got a great little walleye rig that looks a lot different and what Chris is saying is the freedom of the bait that bait by it really swings up and down all the movement because it's on a yeah. ring it's on a ring compared to being tied direct and that makes such a huge difference that thing is almost flying it's floating through the you know like it's tons of action on that thing when you want Even it when you cast it or pitch it you can see it wobbling different than anything you've ever had just because of that freedom of movement and it and it really it's it, it does a great job you can do it a hard bottom it'll also it's like a mini drop shot like i said it keeps your bait up off the bottom so if you're dragging for smallies you keep away from zebras too and, and, and again, it goes back. To, it's going back to basics, guys. It's it's it, the, we keep reinventing the, the the baits and reinventing the fishing industry and reinventing ourselves and the time on the water. But a lot of this stuff is simple stuff. You don't need hundreds of thousands of dollars to go fishing. I mean, no. that, that doesn't cost very much. Very effective. You can use the plastic you already got. You can buy new stuff. You can buy the weight you've already got. So everything is is gone back to being a little simpler. And, and think of it, fishing started out as a simple thing, right? You, you threw yeah. a worm out there and then you went and had a picnic. And then you came back because the line was going to pull on <laughs> That's it. true. That's what yeah. happened, right? So the, sometimes we make it overcomplicated. And, and all these guys have done, um, I'm talking the pros that, that actually developed this stuff, is fine-tuned simple. Yeah. So they made it, and you know those two weights, obviously exactly what you know, but also the two as they're clacking along. Of course. They sound. Yeah. Especially you know, if you're using tungsten with it being yeah. so hard, you just click, 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 click. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's a great fish. So it's wonderful. I love this. Even though I've been out of it for a while, I love this industry. I, I, there's nothing like it. Well, the other thing too is, and is you know, with BMC working so hard at this, one of the other things we see, everybody's using wacky rigs. Yeah. And they realized, holy smokes, I, it's basically one bait per fish unless you use a ring on them. And th what they do is they have these applicator rings, which go, of course, right over basically the middle. And you put your hook underneath it, and it helps you save a few baits. So what VMC or what Cyril did, again, over, over to Japan, comes back with an idea. What they were using is a flat band instead. So the, the drawback of those rings is that they roll off the side of your hook or they'll pull one way or another. And then ultimately you have a, a bait that's like this with a ring over it this way. And the only option you have is to put your hook, you know, underneath that ring. It's not, it's not sitting the way you want it to. It's parallel with the bait. So what they did is actually came up with a band with a, an actual a hump on the top of it that yeah. has a crossway to through it. So there's, it goes like this. So you can now put the band over your bait. It doesn't roll because it's flat. And then it has this hump, which allows you to put your, your hook through instead of the bait or under the ring, it takes you through the ring either way. And they won an ICAST award with that this year. They've won the last two years in a row with the all, you know, the same kind of things. It's just unbelievable. The, the way they think about things and, and how, yeah. It's super exciting. I mean, it, it, everybody uses these baits, everybody wacky rigs. And now with the Nico style, that's where it was kind of born with, you know, so now you can put a perpendicular or you put it parallel or you hook. With the when I saw that, I thought that is a great idea. It's just like somebody reinvented that little wheel. You know what I mean? They're just yeah. they're perfecting something. Uh, Mike, now, Mike, I think you have a, a Nico 
rigging in the background just to show people what a what a regular o-ring looks on on this uh nico rig um there's the that's the the hook etc but the one that's where with the with the worm right on it mikey if you got that one right there yeah. like that one there um basically that little o-ring is uh is the way you hold it on you can put it you punch it through a little bit of the worm to your hook but that's the basically the way that's what wacky rigging is all about what chris saying is now it's a thicker band uh, and then you go through the band itself uh, uh parallel to the worm now not 90 degrees but it, it's, it, so it gives you the option so if you're going to well, wacky you get you through that way the interesting thing is that nico rig is um, what can be overlooked is there is a bullet weight in the bottom of that and so what happens is instead of it being wacky which is just folded in half and hooked in the middle it's basically the same thing folded in half now there's a weight on the other end and you have it drop down and when you pull it it looks really great but yeah. you can adjust where that ring goes it doesn't have to be in the middle you put a little exactly. bolt in the bottom and you get a little bit more violent action out of it but if Mike, you're Mike, can you show that snags? You can roll it up and use it up higher. So, so you see in that image there, folks, you just take a look at the head of that worm, the bottom part, there's a little bit of a nail. That's a little nail weight that's in there. So you just push it right in the end of the worm, and that's your weight. So if you didn't have that weight in there, that, that worm would barely drop down. But with that weight in there, what Chris is talking about, that's the way you weigh it. So it's hidden in there. It goes down head first, and then the, the placement of the ring is how that bait reacts, sort of thing like that. So. And speaking of the weight, the weight plays a very, very important part because sometimes these fish, when you first cast out and the bait hits the water, it sort of, you know, it doesn't sink. It sort of sits there and suspends for a little bit, and then it slowly sinks. And if you're not catching fish right away, maybe they're they're wanting it a little faster presentation to the bottom so you stick the nail in there it can be a regular nail by the way Make yeah sure. you can, can be a regular nail with or without a head a finishing nail it can be anything but the size of that nail so now you know go go and get a size two or three different size finishing nails because the size of that nail will determine how quickly the bait drops the line and sometimes they want it to drop quickly so keep yeah. experimenting with like what what can it cost you? Ten cents for the whole season of nails, uh, yeah. different weight, and you'll catch more fish. And once you catch more fish, oh, it, the world changes for you. Oh once yeah. Two of you are going to be fishing on a hard bottom. It's very similar to what you were just talking about, Reno, with those clacking weights. If you don't push that weight all the way in and you leave that tip out, when it hits the bottom, you get tick 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 tick. tick. Yeah. Um, it's amazing. You know, the other one that's uh, been really cool is the uh, the Ned Rig. And the Ned Rig's been huge, but it's been out for a while. And and so what you were talking about a little bit earlier, um, Pete, was the uh, the tiny child rig. And this is something that, so I, I'm a member of, uh, or I'm, uh, you know, I, I pay for the service of Bass University. So Mike Iaconelli, I used to help um you know, when I was back in marketing, I used to sponsor Mike and doing these things. And they've gone now to this phenomenal online system where you can go in and watch videos. And you have, in fact, they have a month sign up right now where you can sign up for free and see it. They have over 700 videos. They have some of the most incredible anglers in the world talking about various different products. It's not product specific. It's just techniques and, and it's phenomenal. And so one of the ones that I picked up that I didn't realize is this ch uh, tiny child rig. What I didn't realize is it was actually Dan Quinn, who is our, um, actually is our pro staff coordinator in the US, was the one that actually helped develop this thing. So here it is an internal company thing. I'd not even heard of it. And it's a variation of the Ned rig that changes it instead of the weight down where it's driving and you, anybody who's fished the Great Lakes knows that if you're dragging along the bottom, you're gonna get eaten up by zebra mussels. And unfortunately, it's always about the time you hook about a six pounder and it does its first leap and it breaks off and you realize, yeah, I should have cut my line, retied. But this thing, instead of sitting weight down, it's actually uh, weight at the bottom, but your tie is at the top. So it's it's a totally different way that you gotta look it up. It's super, super simple. It's the same thing as a Ned rig or a uh, uh, the Nico weight. So you've got the Nico weight in it and then it's it's uh, um, Texas rigged at the top. And so you're pulling it up. So you can drag that for miles and your line and hook will never touch the bottom. It doesn't get abrasion. And it just looks exactly like an ed rig. It looks fascinating when I was looking at it the other day. Yeah, it yeah. looks fascinating. Yeah. The I video that, that Chris sent to, to and Reno, I sent it to Reno afterwards. It's, a, it's actually walleye guys that were fishing in current in wood. 
and they needed a way of getting a presentation through all that wood and everything and then bring it down and back up real quick. It's pretty amazing. So you just, you're going to have to Google it. It's the tiny, tiny child rig. Is that what it's called? Yeah, tiny child rig, yeah. Tiny child rig. And it's, uh, it's pretty, pretty cool. You'll see a few videos on it. And, and like Chris said, it's, like it's, it's hours old. It's been around a little longer than that, but he's right. It's a really new technique that's not very well known by people. And it's just a, yeah. a variation of everything that's been out there already, right? So and You'll have most of the stuff already to do it. That's the nice exactly. thing. You don't go out and purchase anything. Um, and and you, you can just make it up. The, and I, I encourage people, go to the, the SPAS University, get your first month for, for free. It's it's not anything that I have anything to do with. It's just really cool. And Mike does probably the best video I've ever seen on that rig, how to tie it, what to throw it on, how to fish it, the whole thing. And I mean, and then take it out in the lake and catch a bunch. It, it's a really cool deal. So they just got to go to Bass University, just to Google up Bass University and it'll go to there, I'm assuming. Yeah, right? Yeah, and again, it's not anything that we have anything specific to do with. It's just strictly a very, very good resource for uh, for techniques that are cutting edge like that. I mean, these things pop out, and like I said, I'm I'm in the industry and I'm learning from it. So it yeah it's a good resource. Yeah. And Mike's very entertaining is for the videos that he does are very entertaining as well. So so you can oh, yeah. Yeah. factor only. It's he's good. He's very good. This yeah. this is all uh, the best of the best bass fishermen in, basically in the U.S. says, but well, it's worldwide really. But the the majority come from the U.S. It's, it's they got them all there. Kevin Van Dam, they got Wheeler, they got everybody that they can, you know anybody that's anybody out there um, for you. And it's you don't have to be a bass fisherman to pick up on techniques like that right there. Like we just said, that's a walleye technique right in the yeah. bass world. The bass world, you can bring it in the walleye. You, hell, you can do a big plastic. You can do that on a muskie in a, on a river. You could, you, you know, you could drag a big giant Sanko or something like that and catch a muskie on that thing. You know what yeah, I mean? Absolutely. You know, you can move, move and groove in different ways. Um, probably should start wrapping her up, boys. Um, Anything else, Chris, uh, really pertinent in the world of fishing that uh, people need to look out for? Do you guys want to go over this Lund thing? Uh, no? No, I don't want to go over that. Folks, <laughs> <laughs> well, it's strictly an internal joke. It's, it, don't worry about it. it. It's just Reno being Reno Stern. Let's go over that. the Prince Craft thing. Is that what you meant to say? You want to go over that Prince Craft Absolutely. thing? Absolutely. That's, that's yeah. a, here, I'm going to. I can't yeah, even tell my wrong there, your face. I don't know why. Why you, 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 I try to shut your lips there. <laughs> <laughs> you almost did, but it didn't work, buddy. You were uh, you know, I, that, that, I'm just me stirring crap. That's well, all. That. Just, to, just to change the subject because it, that got uncomfortable. Why, why is Ange off? <laughs> Angelo. <laughs> Angelo. <laughs> uh, well, know, I said I'm not going to say anything, but I couldn't. There, do it. There's nothing embarrassing about it. There's nothing, oh, there's nothing horrible about it. There's nothing. But there is a dude of the doctor. <laughs> oh, that would be horrible. I can't guarantee anything else. People have probably picked up on it by now. What he's, uh, what he's, uh, uh, you know, it, it, at Doctor Four. You know, it's a, let's just say it's a thing that men need to do every so often. How's that when you get older? Yeah, it was, it was a schedule procedure. Exactly. Yeah, but Angelo and schedules don't work very well. So that's you know, it. <laughs> Come up to me on Wednesday, Wednesday morning. He says. Oh my God! I think I gotta go to the doctor right now. And then he called the doctor. He says, "Oh no, it's not till Friday." Sorry. So he, yeah, that's it with the scheduling. It was like it's like, um, yeah, Chris. Anything else that you could want to go over quickly? Uh, people can look out for, um, you know, anything product. Boat ramp etiquette for two two minutes. Let's talk about that. What is boat ramp etiquette? Very oh. okay. Quick, uh, Chris brought it up. Yeah. Sure, we'll talk about yeah. it for you know what? Boat ramp etiquette is something everybody in Canada that has a trailer, okay, should learn. Yes. And unfortunately, less than 1% of the people backing into that ramp at any given time know anything about etiquette at the at the boat ramp. Right. And, it, and it is the most ugly situation you can find yourself in, both as the backer upper who has no experience doing it, yeah. and if you happen to be the boat or two or three behind waiting to, for him to finish up so you can get in. Okay? Right. Folks, all the stuff about these, these boats will stay on those trailers with the front hook engaged, even if it's a roller trailer. So keep your front hook engaged until you back it down and, and then release it at that point. So all else you can do from two miles back. Mm -hmm. You can stop two miles back on the road and fix your rods and reels and get your thermos full of coffee and fix it up nice, nice. And, you know, everything can be in that boat rather, rather at the time rather than back up and start dumping stuff into it holding up everybody else. 
Great. And also, when it's a it's a two lane ramp, use it as a two lane ramp. Oh, that's true. Yeah. You know, no, I get it. I get it. You know what? A lot of them don't know how to back up, so that one I can forgive. But certainly, don't get ready on the ramp when you're ready to go fishing. I do have one small story about that. When when I first started dating my my wife, we went to Niagara Falls and we had dinner at, at that circular restaurant. Mm -hmm. And there was a couple sitting next to us, and uh, Sandy and I were taking trying to take a selfie. And he's, he he walks over. He says, "Reno, can I help you with that?" I, I sure. Yeah. So he took a picture of us. He says, "You don't remember me, do you?" I said, "No, I don't remember you. I, I apologize. I'm sorry. I'm just really bad." Well, he says, "You made me feel about that small. Ooh. You yelled and screamed at me at a launch ramp." No, not Reno. And I remember that. I remember that. <laughs> and, and I but here in Kingston, as a matter of fact, here this guy was we were trying to fish the pro am. Okay, there was like 30 cars behind me. I was next up, and here's this guy. Half an hour, he's still in the ramp. And, and, and so I, you know, I get out of the car and I yell at him. You know, get out of the ramp or do it at home or whatever the hell I said. I said. And that guy remembered. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, oh. I, I had an opportunity to apologize about what 10 15 years later i had an opportunity for yelling at him but both ramp etiquette folks please do yourself a favor look professional do it professional and if you can't do it hey go there when there's nobody there and practice on how to back in and out of that thing with the boat fully loaded that's chris, it you got anything on that one chris yeah uh, run into it so many times here especially locally uh, so i live about two minutes from lake scugog and i've had uh, my son out with me and i've had a grown man yelling and cursing at him when i got off the dock and walked up because he didn't realize the system and i mean my kid's 11 years old he's unfortunately like me so he's big and the guy just thought that uh, you know hey i'm just gonna chirp him out right and I was there. In fact, I just took pictures of it. There was a guy who backed down, just what you said, Reno. He's sitting on the ramp. He's inflating a boat, which is fine. I mean, hey, everybody has their thing, but inflate it off to the side. He actually had a silicone gun out. He was gluing stuff together. Uh, I mean, it's crazy. I had another guy on a flatbed. He was backing his sea dew in um, to, to see, you know, he was going to repair it right there on the ramp. And there's four or five boats behind. It's just common courtesy, guys. Like, you know what? Get your boat ready way back, and and if there's a lineup, then you can do it there. And then when you get to the ramp back up, everybody's got patience. If you can't back a boat up, then everybody's been there. We all get it. We'll, we understand. But if you take a half an hour to get it to the ramp and then actually decide at that point to start getting it ready, it, it ruins everybody's fun. I've seen fist fights. It's just crazy. Get your boat ready off to the side. When you get to the point where you're backing it down, you're going to back it right down into the water. And then once you get your boat in the water, move it down to the end of the dock because the half an hour it takes you to park your vehicle. Nobody else can go back and forth. They're just very, very simple things. And take the time, have some common courtesy, and help people. You can get out and yell at people if you want. But <laughs> yeah, that's just my character. I know I was wrong, and, and, you know, I apologize 10 years later. It, it, right. But and you know you 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 feel bad about it afterwards. But I mean, in all reality, if somebody's new at it and I can help them out, then then you know what, I'll grab a rope and help. And them absolutely. Too. Well, Richard and Ken have both said there. They both said the same thing. Uh, if you ask people for for help, they'll help you. Reno and yeah. Chris and myself and Angelo and whoever's there. You know, it's going to help the whole system. It's going to get everybody moving quicker. So you can ask anybody there, guys. Don't feel embarrassed because the more, more embarrassing part is when you jackknife your vehicle and your, and your trailer and that. So if you can get some help on that, uh, just ask for it. Now, I'll, I'll add a couple points in here. Take your, tr your truck, your car, whatever you're towing with, and your trailer, any type of trailer, and go to a big empty parking lot. And just start backing it up and practice bar backing it up. Not even yeah. you're making turns or whatever, trying to go straight and then making a turn and then find the system that works for you. My system is the bottom of my steering wheel, the, whichever way I turn that, that's the way my trailer is going to go. And I've done that forever. I can. I used to use my mirror, or my look back the, through the window, which is a great way to do it if you have a truck or something like that, if you can see your rig. But now I use my mirrors, it's even better. It's, nice, it's really nice to use your mirrors when you get used to it. That's what will happen. That's the progression you get. But the more you practice it, the better you'll get. Don't practice it on the boat ramp, like Chris was saying, like Reno was saying. Don't practice it there, it, you know, unless the boat ramp's empty, like Reno said, talked about earlier. There are times when there's a little ramp and it's empty. That's. I'll give you a, a really good one. you got to look it up on Google. 
look up Family Guy or Peter Griffin. I don't know what it is. Launching the boat. Have you seen that one, Chris? Yeah, it's great. It really sounds up the weekend. It is hilarious. You will see what a bad person at a boat launch looks like. It's Family Guy launching a boat or Peter Griffin launching a boat. And it is, you'll see exactly what we're talking about, what bad boat etiquette, uh, boat launch etiquette is. <laughs> and, and this ultimate way of launching the boat is the best. <laughs> uh, anyway, so what we're going to do now, I think Mikey's got readied up there. Uh, we're going to do a little lightning round. If Mikey has that graphic, that would be more than awesome i'd have to say chris i you watch this a little bit here now you know this is actually reno you know what and uh, you don't have any do you have any questions reno or no no okay so this is perfect what this is uh chris is just i'm going to throw out some questions for you to you one word answers as simple answers as you can okay. give I'm not trying to hook you in anything here like that and you know what reno We'll do the same with you, buddy. Okay. I'm gonna oh, do me. I like this. So I'll start with I'll start with Chris on this one. No, I'm gonna start with Reno because the next one's more Chris oriented. Guinea pig. <laughs> better, what's a better boat material? Aluminum or fiberglass? Reno. What do you prefer? Fiberglass. Chris, what do you prefer? Fiber aluminum. See, there you go. Aluminum versus fiberglass. I love it. So there you go. And they have the, re the reasons. Chris is sponsored by an aluminum company. He's used aluminum boats a lot. We're sponsored by Princecraft. We see the benefits of aluminum. You don't see too many airplanes flying in the sky that are made out of fiberglass. People. No, okay. I understand that. But six foot <laughs> waves and when it's a when it's a, a 2,000 pound boat, it cuts through them a little better. Yeah, if cool. you're into six foot waves, absolutely. That's the only one. That's the only one. So, okay, next question. Chris, this is really for you. Crankbaits. Balsa or plastic? One. Pick one for the rest of your life. Balsa. Balsa. Reno. Balsa. There you go. I would. I probably tend to agree. I, I have some favorite crankbaits that are made of balsa that I. And when I lose them, I'm going to cry. Yep. I have stuff that just. I'm going to be so mad if a pike takes them away. So that's a three for balsa. And there's a world of plastic crankbaits out there, folks. But that's yep. pretty good. I'll go to to uh, Reno next. First, and then Chris after that. Nico or wacky rigging? One time, you can do it the rest of your life. Nico. Nice. Chris? I'm going to go wacky. I'm going to go wacky as well on that one, just because it's you can weight it with a jig head. You can still make a weight with it and all that kind of stuff. But And it's kind of a little more subtle-ish, I guess. A little more finesse, though, guys. A little more I like where they I live. Like I like the Nico rig for specific targets. So if you're fishing a rock, you know there's a fish there. You got, it's good. It's you just can't cover the water the same way as you would with a wacky rig. And given the position that it's the only thing I can use the rest of my life. Yeah. I'd wacky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a good point. Either one of them though works just. Oh, right. awesome. Yeah. Absolutely. That's why I think that was the great thing about the show today is about we talked about the Ned rig, the Nico rig, the little the crazy child rig, and all that kind of stuff. So people. I a child rig. Yeah, I'm gonna try. I'm gonna try. I'm gonna set it up for sure. I'm gonna set it up. Last one. Uh, we're gonna start with Chris on this one. Only one you can choose the rest of your life: smallmouth bass or largemouth bass. Largemouth, uh, even hesitation. Beautiful, you know. I can't decide. I cannot you choose. Have to. You have to. I, well, I, it's, okay, the sheer quantity in, in any one particular location, then smallmouth. There you go. See, there's two of it. Pete Bowman says. I'm with Chris without hesitation, largemouth. Without uh, me too, but the problem is I want five pounders when I go for largemouth. Okay, and then uh, here where I am now, you can get forty three uh, pounders all at once, and it, it it it's hard to give that up. <laughs> that uh, I hear you. Well, buddy. you know, and throwing into that junk and getting hung up and get it in there. Whereas I hear the water's all open and oh, you know, you can get them on the top, wacky rig them, you can Ned rig them. They jump every time. They're perfect. They pull like trucks. I get you. You can see them on, on the on the on the on the equipment. You can see it on the chart. You can see everything <laughs> there. That's so true. I love, I love largemouth. That's how I cut my teeth on fishing. I largemouth. Yeah. But yeah. but there's a lot to be said for the fish oh, in the wide open water for smallmouth in an area that my gars. I think just with, with large mode, just very quickly to end this off, it's just there's something about it that guys and girls just get hung on and they just, it's it's a never ending battle and it's a never, you're constantly evolving and it's just, there's something, it's the hunt. 
it really is the hunt. It's the hunting yep. of all fishing is really what largemouth fishing is, more so than smallmouth, more so than anything. Maybe musky might come close to it, but that's just the way I look at it as a hunt for a fish, right? Yep. Some of the best anglers I know in the, are hunters, and that's the way they treat it for largemouth. Exactly. But in my memory, the, the largemouth on that underwater point facing into the current on, on Lake St. Francis that we're all oh, you know, the, oh, oh, the largemouth. Oh, yeah. The, the smallmouth were out here. Yeah, yeah. yeah remember that? that oh, was, yeah. Oh, that was heaven. Totally different, right? Totally something totally different. different. That's why the largemouth guys like what they do because this, these things were supposed to be smallmouth out there and they weren't. They were yeah, largemouth. And they weren't. They were large. Yeah. Boys, thank you so much uh, for uh, joining me and Angelo's absence of being violated or whatever he's doing over there in his little. Uh, <laughs> Reno, thank you again for that, buddy. This is uh, everybody that's just joined us. You can see Reno's jumpsuit there. Uh, you can watch this again on YouTube, and you'll see he'll he displays it well. Uh, and he's re he's put that up for a prize for us as a giveaway, and and he's got his Rapala patches on it. Speaking of Rapala patches, Chris has got his Rapala hat on right now. I'd like to thank Chris for joining us too, uh, talking to us about his product, telling us the, the history of Rapala, the pronouncing the pronouncing of it, Rapala. If you think of it in the in the words world of Finnish people, Finlanders, that's the way they would say it. Rapala, rapala, rapala. But uh, uh, Chris was saying it earlier. So thanks, Chris, for stopping by and enlightening us and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, it's uh, my pleasure. On the products, etc., on the rigging and that. And gents, uh, I bid you adieu and thank you so much for joining me. It has been awesome. I think the people here really enjoyed it. So cool. That's great. Goodbye, thanks, everybody. I think I'm gonna like BC pipe fishing. <laughs> Unbelievable BC Lake. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, oh. That's what it's all about right there, brother. Coming in and catching these all day. Hey. What a fishery up here. BC, pike like this in British Columbia in the Rocky Mountain. <laughs> 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 Another beauty. Like, look at the size of these fish. <laughs> <laughs>